Chapter 17 of Bonaparte in Egypt and the Egyptians of Today. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Macmillan. Bonaparte in Egypt and the Egyptians of Today by Haji A. Brown. Chapter 17 Fakoda and After. Marchand is at Fakoda. Day and night, night and day since the great fight at Omdurman, the telegraph had been busy sending and receiving messages of all kinds. A wondrous medley of tidings, congratulations, lamentations, inquiries, hopes, fears, rejoicings. Almost all the emotions that stir in the hearts of men, going to and fro over the wires mingled with dry official reports, prosaic details of army and commissariat work, and now and then the flowing periods of some war correspondent still at the front. But of all the telegrams that went down to the city of the Khedives in those days, there was none other that had a message to move not only the people of the town and country, but those of the whole civilized world, such as that which went, not in simple English words, but wrapped in the mystery of an official code, as the confirmation of the rumor for the verification or contradiction of which all the news-reading, news-hearing world was anxiously waiting. Marchand is at Fakoda. That was the purport, though not the words, of the message, and never since the day on which the English troops had entered Cairo, just sixteen years before, had there been in the town or country anything like the excitement this intelligence induced. Everywhere, among all classes and nationalities, the word Marchand and Fakoda were on the lips of all. It was natural enough that it should be so. Over two years had passed away since news had been received in Cairo that a French expedition, under the command of a certain Captain Marchand, had started from Loango on the west coast of Africa, bound for the interior of the continent, Nothing was known as to the ultimate object or destination of this expedition, but as, from time to time, rumors of its progress reached the outer world, the suspicion that it was aiming at the Nile began to spread. When, therefore, the report that there were white men at Fakoda went down to Cairo, all Egypt jumped to the conclusion that these white men must be Marchand and his companions. Only those in close touch with the life of the country at the time can form any idea of the intense eagerness with which the confirmation or contradiction of this rumor was awaited. That eagerness arose from the recognition of the fact that if Marchand were indeed at Fakoda, his presence there must inevitably bring France and England face to face for a struggle which, whether it should be carried on by force of arms or by might of words, must decide once for all which of the two powers was thereafter to be preeminent in Egypt. The reactionary party was jubilant. Now, at last, the French would have to assert their rights and privileges, defend their honor, and justify their claims. And how could they do aught of these things otherwise than by maintaining the position the gallant Marchand had gained? And how could they maintain that position without driving the English out of Egypt? And if some of the party were less confident than others in their anticipations of the answer that France would give to these questions, they were not less hopeful of the coming early discomfiture of the hated English. So hopeful were they, indeed, that the veriest stranger might have picked them out in the streets by the joyous air they wore. By the Englishmen in Egypt, as by those elsewhere, the news was received as news of the greatest gravity. It was impossible to ignore the fact that the position was one of the most serious nature, and one from the difficulties of which there was no possible escape except by war, or a happy and scarcely to be hoped for combination of diplomatic skill and generous consideration on the part of each of the two rivals. For Marchand himself the greatest sympathy was felt. His presence at Fakoda was the practical realization of a daring and almost hopeless ambition proving that he possessed in the highest degree those lofty qualities of the best of his race, the courage, vigor, enterprise, that in spite of all obstacles have always kept alive among us something of a spirit of comradeship for our off-time ally and off-time foe. We laugh now and then, freely enough at our neighbor across the channel, but we respect him all the same, for no one knows better, nor indeed so well as we, the sterling qualities of his race and Marchand's feat was one that placed him in the foremost rank of men of fearless heart and daring action, and entitled him to a place beside our own Stanley as a dashing and heroic pioneer. Gladly, however, as we should have seen Marchand reap the full fruit of his long, toilsome, and perilous journey, we could not, with justice to either Egypt or ourselves, yield it to him. Our aims were alike. His magnificent march through the unknown dangers of some of the wildest parts of Africa the campaign we had just brought to a successful and triumphant conclusion were alike efforts to win the same prize, the possession of the Egyptian Sudan. We could not both have it. We could not share it. 
it must go to either france or egypt one or the other must surrender the prize so nearly within its unquestioned grasp we could only be generous to marchand and france by being disloyal to egypt and ourselves there is no need to repeat here the story of the negotiations that followed that belongs indeed not to the story of egypt but to that of england or france for egypt by itself could no more have contended with france for the possession of the soudan than it could have regained it without the aid of england the question therefore was one between england and france and happily for all the mutual goodwill of the two nations so tempered their discussion of the interests and claims involved that war was averted and the french consented to withdraw from the soudan but the course of the negotiations was necessarily slow it demanded little less than heroic fortitude on the part of the french government to give a decision that it well knew could not fail to be extremely unpopular and some weeks therefore elapsed before the decision could be announced and the order issued to marchand for his retirement from fashoda meanwhile it was quite natural that to the amateur politicians of egypt the problem should seem to be unsolvable save by an appeal to the sword to the educated egyptian especially this appeared the one possible solution unable to comprehend rivalry without enmity or to see in an open opponent anything but a foe to be crushed at any cost they never dreamt that england and france could both approach the subject in a conciliatory spirit and it is a striking illustration of the attitude they took that they discussed the question solely and entirely as one between england and france scarcely anywhere was a word to be heard from the natives as to the claims of their own country or the least recognition of the fact that it was egyptian and not english interests that were at stake the truth is that at the moment the only question in which the egyptian took the smallest interest was the one whether england or france was in the future to control the destiny of the country there was much talk of liberty of independence but it is doubtful if even the most sincere looked upon all this as anything more than a phrase of the anti-english agitation assuredly there was not a man in the country who did not know and believe however reluctant he might be to admit it that egypt had and could have no other future before it than one dominated by some foreign power or powers that the independence they talked of and that of which they were unceasingly dreaming were very different things no one more thoroughly recognized than they themselves and so though the patriot politicians never said so and probably never realized that it was so the one real objection they had to the presence of the english in the country was the fact that they themselves were out of power and hopelessly incapable of attaining it so long as english influence should prevail this was particularly the case of the so-called turkish party which was in much the same position as that of the protestant ascendancy party in ireland after the union unlike that party however they had one hope that the rivalry of the european powers might afford them an opportunity of regaining something if not all of their lost prestige and power and unlike that party being bound by no ties of loyalty or blood to the power that wounded their susceptibilities or to the people of the country they cared for nothing but the gratification of their own ambitions towards the english therefore their feeling was one of invincible hatred towards egypt and the egyptians of utter indifference towards france one of hopefulness such as the irish insurgents had turned towards the same country while yet bonaparte was on his way to alexandria fakoda was consequently to these what kalala had been to the irish and marchand and other humbert the parallel is complicated by the entire lack of support the two daring adventurers met with and by the absolute frustration of all their hopes it is a curious coincidence that two of the events thus compared the former which cannot now be regarded as anything but the knell of french influence in egypt should find its parallel in an event taking place in the very year and month in which bonaparte had struck the first blow in favor of french ascendancy in the land of the pharaohs had the members of the anti-english party been skilled in history the parallel might have seemed to them an omen of disaster as it was they had but the single fact of marchand's presence at fakoda to consider and most earnestly they prayed that it might prove the downfall of english influence in egypt how apart from the classes i have spoken of the great body of the people thought was not so evident but it is none the less certain this vast patient mass of humanity had for years been hearing and was still daily hearing that the english had no other object and no other ambition in egypt than that of self-aggrandizement they were taught by the press the pakas and the ulema that they were being despoiled and downtrodden by the hated ferengi but if they listened silently and apparently approvingly they could not but feel that it was not so of what the english were doing or not doing they really knew almost nothing everything that was done was done in the name of the khedive when it was good 
he and he alone got the credit when it was bad or such as they could be persuaded to believe was bad it was invariably attributed to the tyranny of lord cromer and the malice of the english all that the peasantry and the people generally knew for certain was that on the whole they were satisfied with things as they were the english might be ruining the country and enslaving the people but each man felt and knew that whatever they were doing he himself the individual was personally better off than he had ever been before almost all the evils that had most oppressed him the corvee the corbag the endless fear of the tax collector of the officials of all grades and the perpetual uncertainty as to what new trials another day might bring him all these and other evils had either disappeared or had been mitigated in a degree of which he was fully conscious he could not understand it and felt indeed as the man who felt among thieves must have felt towards the good samaritan the one he had been taught to despise and revile as an incarnation of evil had come to him as a benefactor and amongst the solid and invaluable advantages that the people were conscious of there was no set-off save the rooted aversion to non-muslim control while this again was counterbalanced by the fear that any further change might and most probably would be a change for the worse but ages of oppression have engrafted upon these people a habit of the utmost reticence in the expression of their thoughts a reticence so deep so perfect that no man among them ever wholly unburdens his soul to another not to his nearest kin much less to a stranger whatever thoughts they uttered were consequently but the echoes of those which so far as they could judge were most likely to keep them in favour with those immediately around and above them it is not surprising therefore that the english in egypt could learn nothing of their real thoughts or that they regarded the people as ungrateful and unappreciative but if of necessity the english failed as in the east they ever do fail to understand the people those who were working in the districts in close daily touch with them could see by incontestable and constantly growing signs that they were developing an absolute confidence in the englishman's love of justice and in the reality of his desire to benefit the people and clear-minded anglo-egyptians were beginning to see as the wisest anglo-indians have long since seen in india that these two characteristics are the battalions that best buttress the might of england in the east for from cairo to calcutta the peoples sum up what they regard as the typical englishman almost in the words of the eton boy he is a beast but he is a just beast nor was it only among the peasantry and those classes of the people who derived most benefit from the presence of the english that this feeling prevailed of all classes in the country the effendis the small officials were those who gained the least and suffered the most from the english occupation from petty tyrants they had been degraded to mere quill drivers their service no longer opened to them vistas of possible elevation to high places no longer brought them the servile submission they had in the old days been able to extort from the people in general they could no longer more or less openly enhance their incomes by selling their favour or by other means that had formerly made their posts valuable nor could they practice or benefit from the nepotism and favouritism that had been their prerogative they of all classes had in the past been the least prejudicially affected by the rise or fall of governments or rulers and suffered least of all from the tyranny and cruelty that wrecked the lives of others and they of all gained almost absolutely nothing from the benefits that under the english were already enriching the classes above and below them but of all classes of the people probably none has been more misunderstood or more misjudged than this amidst all that has been written of egypt and its peoples nowhere do we once find a suggestion that this class has ever been anything but a greedy grasping servile pack of bribe-seeking torture-using petty tyrants that such a description was too often and too generally a just one cannot be denied but we must remember the circumstances in which these men were placed for the most part younger and more or less penniless sons of fathers too poor or too uninfluential to give them a fair position they were invariably crippled at their start in life by want of money and their complete dependence upon the favour of their immediate superiors the first lesson taught them in their new career was to bend to the esprit de corps which ruled the official life of those days that is to say to recognise the value of their positions as these were seen and valued by their fellows to look upon the superior officials as patterns to be followed and imitated without question in all things what wonder if the young official bowed to the inevitable and learning as his second lesson that taught by iago put money in thy purse and knowing that resistance or remonstrance could only result in his being thrown aside and plunged in want and misery yielded whatever protests his better nature may have been inclined to make 
and so became such as he has so often been painted. And as time went on, with every step he made onward in his official career, he was plunged deeper and deeper in the mire of the necessity that swamped every good or honest aspiration he might have had. For, as he progressed step by step, so the claims upon his purse rose steadily, and the demands upon his services increased. It was then, and still is, the custom of the impecunious Egyptian to settle himself as a dependent upon some of his well-to-do relations, and thus the rising official had, in general, not only his own family to support, but a troop of indigent relatives of his own and of his wives' or wives' families. And thus as he advanced, if his increased influence enabled him to gain a larger income from bribes and commissions, it doubled and redoubled his expenses, and compelled him, in his turn, to pay larger bribes. What result could such a system bring about other than the corruption of the whole service? Yet, atrocious as were the consequences, those who have criticized this class have been unjust to them. It has invariably been forgotten that the abominable corruption that existed in Egypt up to the purification of the government services by the English was not only not of necessity the result of the true character of the people, but that it might have existed in absolute opposition to that character. Nonetheless, I am convinced that this is the truth, and that the fact that it is so has been one of the most potent influences in facilitating the work of reform that has been and is being accomplished. For as soon as this much-abused class had discovered that under the English control they might look for a fair wage according to their rank, feel secure in their possession of their pay, and free from the exactions and oppressions of their superiors, they began to settle down contentedly under the new conditions, and accepted it as a gain that they were no longer subject to the old necessity for acquiring wealth as rapidly as possible, that they might satisfy the greed of those above by despoiling those beneath them. This release from the never-ceasing cares and worries that were inseparable from the old system was perhaps the one direction in which the small officials felt themselves benefited by the English occupation. In the main, therefore, they were content with their lot, and had no desire for any change. The continuance of the occupation would ensure them practically all the conditions that made life most enjoyable to them, and gave them all the liberty they cared for, and they could look for no improvement as a likely or even possible result of any alteration. They knew, too, how perfectly futile it was to hope that Egypt would ever be able to free herself from European or Christian interference. And though they, not less earnestly nor less sincerely than any of their countrymen, deplored the fact, they had the sense to see that, whether that interference was exercised through a visible occupation of the country or simply through diplomatic channels, the eventual result must be the same, so far as Muslim or Egyptian independence was concerned. Among the European colonists... The presence of Marchand at Fakoda produced a ferment compared to which the deep but publicly restrained excitement of the Egyptians was indifference. With the single exception of the Greeks, their sympathies were wholly anti-English, so much so indeed that it might be said that among them the chief gauge of a man's patriotism was the measure of his professed hatred to England and everything English. But, as with the Egyptians, the individuals of each race were, perhaps as often as not, moved rather by self-interest and the Pickwickian desire to shout with the crowd that is a characteristic of the Latin races than by any real hostility. And thus, though apparently solidly united in their enmity to England, they, like the Egyptians, were in reality divided into two camps, the one prepared to welcome almost any change, and the other quite content with the occupation. It was not, therefore, until Marchand had actually abandoned Fakoda that the public regained its normal tranquillity. In the interval, he had passed through Cairo on his way to Paris, but though, as was but just, he had a cordial reception, there was no demonstration of public feeling. It was then an almost foregone conclusion that the French government would withdraw whatever claim it could have made. Yet even when Marchand had returned to the Soudan to put the final stamp of failure on his brilliant success, by hauling down the flag it had cost such heroism to hoist, even then there were in Egypt some who were still hopeful that, in spite of all, the wheel of fate might yet take another turn. Fortunately, the decision that the French should withdraw by pushing on to the Red Sea avoided all risk of further incident, and so, with the news of the departure of the expedition from Fakoda, the last hope of the anti-English party left it, and the public, Egyptian and European, quietly and silently accepted the event as the seal of British supremacy in Egypt. Thus once more the irony of fate made sport of the strenuous efforts of England's foes, 
and rendered their hostility contributory to her strength. All that it could do to hamper and hinder the reconquest of the Sudan had been done by the anti-English party with no greater result than to strengthen, if not altogether to establish, England's claim to an absolute share in the possession of the country. So Marchand struggled onward on his magnificent march, and succeeded in his daring ambition to plant the tricolor on the banks of the Nile, only, in the end, to give English influence and authority in Egypt the unchallenged supremacy England had not sought and that it had been his chief aim to render forever unattainable by her. It is scarcely possible to overrate the service that it was thus the destiny of the gallant captain so unintentionally to confer on England and Egypt alike. From the commencement of the occupation down to his departure from Fakoda, the most powerful influence for evil in Egypt was the uncertainty that hung around the position of the English in the country. With his retirement, that uncertainty came to an end. Thenceforth, the people knew that they had to deal with England, and with England only, and the effect was immediate. Everywhere, and in all things, the English were accepted as the masters, not only for the day, but for the future. That they should now evacuate the country was a proposition at which the Egyptians and colonists alike scoffed, and both alike abandoned as futile whatever hopes they may have had for the realization of some other solution of the problem. From that day, English influence continued to grow steadily and almost all the difficulties that had restricted the efficiency of the Anglo-Egyptian administration steadily diminished. The government of the country ceased to be a house divided against itself, and the endless friction that for many years had persistently hindered the efforts of Lord Cromer and his colleagues for the advancement of the country's interests was at an end. That which of all things had been most needed to facilitate the regeneration of the country that England had undertaken had been the appreciative cooperation of the people. The vast benefits the occupation had conferred and the reconquest of the Sudan had been all insufficient to gain this cooperation, and had it not been for the Fakoda incident forcing a solution of the problem of English supremacy in Egypt, it would still be lacking. As it is, however defective the assistance now accorded may be, its deficiencies are due to causes not arising from either hostility to English influence or the fear of its cessation. From the landing of Bonaparte in July 1798 down to the departure of the French expedition from Fakoda in December 1898, just five months more than a century later, no single occurrence in the history of the country has had such deep and, as it will assuredly prove, lasting influence as this latter, for it wrought in a day what all the might of England and the devoted labors of the English in Egypt could never have accomplished. The English occupation is and will forever remain the chief hallmark in the story of modern Egypt. The happy conclusion of the Fakoda incident was not only its ratification as such, but the birthday of a new era. Since that day, the Egyptians have had new hopes and ambitions. All their aspirations have been turned into new channels. No longer harassed by hesitating doubts as to which of two courses it were wiser for them to take, they now enjoy a degree of political and social liberty such as was never before within their reach. For, no longer dependent upon the uncertain favors of despotic masters, the Egyptian of today is as free to pursue his individual course as any native of the freest countries of the world. As, therefore, the landing of Bonaparte in 1798 was the early dawn of the new era in the history of the people, the evacuation of Fakoda has been its sunburst. End of chapter 17. Fakoda and After. Recording by Graham Macmillan. San Diego, California. Chapter 18 of Bonaparte in Egypt and the Egyptians of Today. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gabby Cowan. Bonaparte in Egypt and the Egyptians of Today by Haji A. Brown Chapter 18 Healthy Influences Though the outline I have given of the history of Egypt under Muhammad Ali and his successors has been of the briefest, it is sufficient for the purpose of this volume. It would no doubt be a study of great interest to see in some detail how the varying characters and actions of their rulers and the events 
this gave rise to affected people but the effects thus produced have proved for the most part of a purely temporary nature and have been of such conflicting characters that without a very elaborate study it would be well nigh impossible to trace their influence upon the egyptian of today. fortunately for my readers patience what we have to do with is the influences that broad and general in the results have also been lasting and are therefore still in operation and just as we may appreciate the force and volume of the mighty mississippi without studying as mark twain and his brother pilots had need to do its ever varying currents and eddies its snags and snarls so we may learn the strength and tendency of egyptian opinion without the stopping to analyze all the incidents that have helped or hindered its development as i have said in my last chapter the foot development of the egyptian character dates only from the evacuation of fakoda as yet indeed the people have taken nothing more than the very first steps towards the adoption of a definite and clearly shaped policy such as can alone give them a truly national and distinctive character during the whole of the past century beaten hither and thither by fluctuating influences and impulses the constant uncertainty that overhung their future reacted upon their thoughts and rendered this as unstable as the event by which they were stirred but since the commencement of the english occupation influences have been at work with a steadily growing effect consolidated and directing the thoughts and aspirations of the whole body of the people and gradually creating a true public opinion such as has never before existed these influences have been but three in number the increased acquaintance of the people with european civilization their increased knowledge of the social and political condition of the mohammedan countries of the world and the development of the arabic press except in so far as it has contributed to the strengthening and enlarging of these influences through the facilities it has afforded for their operation the english administration of the country has had but little effect upon its political or mental development as a nation although upon the personal character of the people that is to say upon the people as individuals it has had a much greater and stronger effect than either the english or the egyptians realize the young egyptian who has grown up under english rule is of altogether a different type to that which his father was whether of the highest or the lowest rank he has a conception of his personal rights and responsibilities that places him socially and politically upon a total different plane to that of his elders the general effect thus produced is that he is more self-reliant more independent and less willing to submit to restraint of any kind than was his father that this change is the source of some evil is as certain as natural but that on the whole it is a change for the better and one tending to the elevation of the people is equally certain eventually it must have a powerful influence upon the political feeling of the country as yet those who are most strongly affected by it are for the most part too young to have any very definite or influential place in the political affairs of the country but they are gradually swelling the ranks of the journalists and in but a few years will be the men in whose hand will be gathered most of the strings by which the people at large are likely to be most strongly moved of all the tasks therefore that the government of the country and those responsible for it are called upon to perform 
if they would ensure the future stability of the present prosperity and the real welfare of the people there is none more important than that of endeavouring by every legitimate and possible means to guide the development of this change into healthy and vigorous directions joined with that loyalty to islam and the turkish empire i have shown to be dominant forces in the country the three influences i have just described are those which are today and must be for long to come the real controlling influences in the political and social growth of the egyptians it is conceivable of course that events might possibly arise to divert nullify or even destroy the effects of one or more of these influences but this is a contingency so remote and so little likely to occur that it is needless to discuss it here it will be well however for us to see a little more of the nature and effect of these influences as they actually exist that these influences have been healthy will have been gathered from what i have already said of them but it is necessary to show in what way or how far they have been so first then let us see what has been the effect of the increased acquaintance of the people with the european civilization omitting all consideration of such minor effects as the adoption of changes in dress in the furnishing of their houses and other details of their daily life the effect that is most potent for good is one that goes much deeper and further than such merely superficial matters as these this effect is the constantly increasing desire for the improvement of the social and political conditions that prevail Ninely awakened to a sense of deficiencies from which they have suffered in the past the people are more and more being influenced by the wish and the will for self-improvement as yet however their views are vague and indefinite and lie rather in the direction of ambitious dreams than of purpose-giving aspirations but though they are eager rather than emulous to be regarded as the intellectual equals of the european peoples it is certain that this desire is at least one of the most powerful of the impulses by which the life of the nation is being stirred as we have seen mahomed ali though a moslem and a native of turkey was essentially a european his knowledge of and sympathy with islamic ideals were of the slightest familiar as he necessarily was with oriental thought and life the egyptian and arab were to him more alien than the western europeans hence his love of european society his passion for innovation on european lines and his frequent sacrifice of mohammedan sentiment to european utilitarianism all that was best in the man was strikingly european in type and character all that was bad was eminently oriental had he had such advantages of early education and such surroundings as bonaparte had had he would in all probability nay certainly have proved a really great man a man of high ambitions and great if not glorious achievements as it was hampered by the want of the most elementary education cramped in aspiration by the narrowness of his experience and with a mind vitiated by the false ideals of those amidst whom he was reared and lived and by the evils of the only political system he had any knowledge of it is not surprising that his rapid rise quickly brought him to a point at which he became the victim rather than the ruler of affairs his personal influence with the people was but small for the popularity that led them to choose him as their governor did not long stand the strains he placed upon it and in carrying out his schemes for the europeanizing of the country 
he met with more opposition than approval and failed to awaken any desire for the change he was so anxious to bring about he succeeded indeed in rendering the people more familiar with european thought and ideals that they had been and thus set in motion the current of thought that is today leading the egyptian to look for the west for his standard of social and political life as we have seen the people had been quite ready and willing to adopt all that they found good in the methods of the french and now that frenchmen and other europeans came amongst them not as conquerors and dictators but as the guests and friends of a muslim governor they were much more willing to hear their views and profit from their advice and instruction the good results that might have sprung from this cause were however very largely barred by the spirit of opposition created by mohammed ali's attempts to force the adoption of unwelcome innovations it was therefore rather in spite than in consequence of his european tendencies that during his reign the egyptians began to have a clearer conception of and more friendly feelings towards their european civilization as a whole under the french with all the faults of their administration a conviction had spread in favor of the advantages of a regularly constituted and properly organized government and with this had also come the recognition of the principle that it should be the aim of a government to protect the interests of the people and that it was for the good of all that the various classes should be treated with equity these are things taught indeed as part of the law of islam but they were parts of the law of which the people had had no practical experience and the discovery they had thus made that christian nations and peoples could and did hold out as ideals and still more to a certain extent bring into actual practice the teachings of the moslem faith awakened in them a new interest in the civilization to which they had so long felt the most irreconcilable hostility it was under the french that these thoughts first began to impress the people under mohammed ali they were extended and grew more familiar but still hindered and checked by the unfavorable conditions that encompassed them they made but little substantial progress yet in defiance of all difficulties they took solid root and when later on under the successors of mohammed ali they were presented under a more favorable aspect they began to sway even the classes that had at first most strenuously opposed them the steady growth of the desire for reform that has thus gone from the time of the french invasion has been almost entirely spontaneous it has sprung as i have said from the increased acquaintance of the people with european ideals brought about by the presence of europeans in their country but this presence which has been the chief cause of the progress made has at the same time been the greatest obstacle in the way of that progress to the present day this is so all that is reactionary in the spirit of the country today is almost wholly and directly due to the presence of europeans in it and the consequences entailed by the presence again and again have i heard some enthusiastic advocate of progress and reform silence and put to shame by some quietly made allusion to some of the evils nurtured by the european consulates or some of the anti-islamic laxities the presence of europeans and the political influence they possess force upon the people this is indeed the great hindrance to progress the drag that stops the egyptian from advancing as he might and could yet in spite of all difficulties that which is really good in the intercourse of two peoples is bearing fruit of necessity 
the first produce of the new feelings thoughts and aspirations stirring to activity the long latent abilities of the people has been little more than a few weak saplings of progress too frail and immature to send forth aught more than a few fragile blossoms but the crop is thriving and though as yet rich in neither quality nor quantity it is the fair promise of a sound healthy and abundant harvest to come it was not until the first half of the nineteenth century had passed that the appreciation of european civilization became at all general it is today almost universal nor is it less powerful for good that it appeals to various classes with varying aspects to many it is no doubt nothing more than an appreciation of the physical advantages offered to the individual by railways electric tramways telegraphs and telephones and the hundreds of other minor inventions that add to the pleasure or tend to the comfort or convenience of life to others it is the higher side of civilization its intellectual and social advantages that appeal most forcibly but these are at the same time appalled and repelled by its evils and thus the very men that it is most desirable should be most strongly influenced are held back from accepting much that they would otherwise welcome and these men while always candid and open in their intercourse with europeans in the expression of their sense of the merits of european civilization and of the backward condition of their own countrymen are withheld by their fear of appearing discourteous or offensive from even hinting at their perception of its evils thus left in ignorance of one of the chief reasons why the egyptian does not more enthusiastically adopt and practice that which he so freely commends europeans are wrongly led to believe that the appreciation he expresses is not sincere it is not so he thoroughly comprehends the advantages he commends but at the same time he sees clearly enough what most strangely the european seems incapable of perceiving that the unrestricted adoption of western standards could not fail to set loose a flood of evils far outweighing all the benefits it could confer hence at the present day the problem that of all others attracts discussion in native circles in egypt is how may we secure the benefits without incurring the evils of european civilization this then is the net result of a century of almost daily increasing acquaintance with the people of europe and the civilization of which they boast it is a problem that many earnest men are studying in various parts of the mahomedan world and which is tending to solve itself by slow but yet perceptible steps in egypt the most hopeful feature of the difficult to be faced is that no one appreciates the need of reform more than or indeed as much as the egyptian himself fortunately he is by no means inclined to accept too hastily the often ill-considered advice europeans are prone to give him for he can see as they cannot the real difficulties to be overcome rightly comprehended then the very slowness of the progress being made so far from being discouraging or to the discredit of the egyptians is quite otherwise for it shows that the advance being made is sure and well grounded and not a mere passing impulse and it is a warranty that all further progress will be well considered and deliberate and will thus be certain of producing more enduring benefit than any hastily adopted reforms however brilliant their first effects might seem to be would be likely to secure 
directly connected with the healthy influence which is thus at work in egypt and other parts of the east is another of a very different character in some respects but tending in exactly the same direction the elevation of the moral social and political standards of the peoples affected by it it is however of much more recent origin for it was not until after the english occupation that the egyptians profiting from their increased intercourse with europeans and the development of the native press of which they are such avid readers began to give attention to the condition of islam outside the narrow limits of the ottoman empire to the present day the fellahin indeed are indisposed to credit the fact that a majority of the moslems of today are not only not subjects of the turkish sultan but do not speak either the arabic or turkish language naturally the english occupation turned the attention of the more enlightened classes to the question of england's relations with her mahomedan subjects in india and elsewhere their conception of those relations were at first drawn from uncertain and most unreliable sources and were scarcely less accurate than unfavorable thanks mainly and directly to the honesty of the moyad the leading mahomedan journal of the country the ignorance that formerly existed has largely disappeared and the news-reading public are now able to follow the progress of events in india and other moslem lands with a fair knowledge of the circumstances affecting them the interest thus excited in the affairs of their brother mahomedans in other lands is steadily increasing and this has led the arabic journals to pay special attention to all that appears in the european press with reference to any matter in which moslems are concerned the outcome of this is clearly marked the egyptians no longer regard their country as they did a few years ago as an isolated unit but see it as part of a great whole of which it is its right and privilege to be the head and with this increased knowledge of the islamic world has grown side by side an increased knowledge of the condition of the european nations and more particularly of the great powers throughout islam it is now recognized that if these powers are no longer inclined to enter upon crusades against the moslem states it is not from any enlarged tolerance for islam nor from any peace decreeing doctrines of christianity or civilization but because they are restrained by the political conditions controlling the relations with each other this is a matter of which it is no use saying smooth things that have no basis of actual fact there is not a single mahomedan in any part of the world who believes any of the many protestations of friendship for islam made by nations or peoples or governments that these professions are genuine enough for the moment that they are not based upon either falsehood or dishonesty of intention is not asserted under existing conditions they are honest and true enough but they depend wholly upon the continuance of those conditions side by side with the growth of this knowledge and the diffusion of the ideas of which it gives rise there has been a similar increase in the knowledge that various moslem peoples have of each other and a growing perception of the causes that have led to the decadence of islam of these latter as very student of history knows the two principal have been disunion among the mahomedan peoples and the stagnation of social and intellectual progress that followed the overthrow of the political power of islam the recognition of these facts by the moslems themselves has pointed them directly to the obvious remedy the reunion of islam and the development of the social and intellectual capacities of its people 
hence the rise of that pan-islamism which has of late been so much discussed and is as yet so completely misunderstood in europe and by europeans living in the east the journalism of today is a very different thing to that of the past its writers are for the most part young men of the day essentially out of touch with the days of their fathers hence we find them presenting to us as novelties ideas that were familiar to all newspaper readers of the last generation and asking us to solve problems that we had thought buried with our grandfathers but in the modern craze for rush and hurry and inefficiency the public have no time to stop to inquire the history of the topics brought before them to some extent conscious of this defect in themselves and others the modern journalist turns to the first comer who can show any pretense of special knowledge on any subject of the day and accepting him and his own valuation takes him as an expert and builds up his own theories and speculations of his authority thus the cook conducted tourist who rushes through egypt and the east without even exchanging a word with any native save perhaps cooks dragon man or donkey boy is invited to give his ideas on the egyptian question and so forth and in doing so very often quotes and as an authority some european who has been living in the country for heaven only knows how many years and who if the truth were known knows scarcely less of the people than the tourist himself since all that he has gained by his years of residence has been the accumulation of a number of prejudices which are to him the explanation of all things touching the past present or future of the land and its peoples if the blind does lead the blind whither can their progress tend as an answer look at the recent comments upon pan-islamism in the european press journals that years ago spoke of pan-islamism as an idea full of lofty promise for the future not of islam only but of the world have taken it up as a new subject treated it as a new movement and hastened to point out that it is a menace to civilization some thirty years have passed since lord Beaconsfield, speaking as the minister for foreign affairs at the guild hall dinner in london drew a brilliant picture of the effects that might spring from the regeneration of islam under the protection and with the aid of england his speech created a world-wide interest but as i pointed out in the bombay gazette of the time i had previously drawn attention to the same idea and i was thus one of the first if not the very first to discuss the subject in an english newspaper in india and in england after filling the public mind for a brief space of time the subject was dropped and the truly imperial views of lord Beaconsfield were relegated to a pigeon hole in the foreign office where if the rats have not yet devoured them they are probably still lying but if england does neglected the idea that as the globe if i am not betrayed by memory described as the offspring of a stupendous intellect it was not so with the statesmen of other countries and from that day to this more than one of the foreign offices of europe has not lost sight of the subject needless to say not with any intention of promoting the views of lord Beaconsfield, nor among moslem peoples has the subject ever been dropped the yearly increasing facility of travelling in the east and the growth of the arabic and indian mahomedan press have naturally tended to help forward the efforts of the more enlightened moslems in various lands who were first stirred 
to movement by the discussion in the european press and today wherever islam exists there is a pan-islamic party generally small but always having as its leaders the most enlightened and most advanced men under the guidance of these men pan-islamism is essentially a defensive and not an aggressive movement one for the elevation of the people and therefore an intellectual and peace-promoting and not a military or war-provoking one that a few of the most ignorant of the people should attach some hazy idea of muslim conquest to their conception of pan-islamism is but natural but to assume that because their vague ill-formed and wholly undigested thoughts now and then find expression in the columns of irresponsible journals run for the most part by men of no position education or influence these are to be taken as the true exponents of muslim thought is absurd instead of being a danger to europe or civilization pan-islamism is a movement that should have the support of every lover of peace and civilization and the fact that it is making progress in egypt is but a proof that the egyptians have awakened to a sense of the only way in which the best and truest interests of their country and their religion can be served if the world at large is ever to see the higher and truer civilization of which it is capable the powers must abandon that lust of conquest that is but a drag on all true progress they must cease to look upon the interest of each as a claim to which the interest of all others must yield and combine to seek the benefit of all the more nearly an ideal is reached the more important will it be that islam should be prepared to take its fitting place in the grand scheme of regeneration that it should do so it must follow now and for ever the ideas that are the mainspring of pan-islamism the third and last of the healthy influences i have named is the development of the arabic press were we to consider merely the number of years the occupation has lasted it might seem reasonable to suppose that it has been the most powerful of all the influences affecting the general character of the people but as i have pointed out in the last chapter it was not until after the evacuation of fakoda that it had any real solid or lasting effect prior to that event the egyptians had undoubtedly learned to appreciate the principles illustrated in the administration of the country by the english but the uncertainty that overhung the future prevented even the warmest admirers and advocates of english methods taking up a strong or definite position in their favor during the earlier part of the occupation which as yet has been by far the longest the greatest benefit conferred upon the egyptians was therefore the freedom it gave them to profit from the influences with which i have already dealt when the change came it found the great majority of the people ready and willing to accept the friendship and guidance of england and the strength and honesty of this feeling was clearly visible in their attitude during the disastrous opening of the south african war which followed so soon after while the armenians openly and offensively rejoiced at every fresh telegram of disaster and defeat the egyptians not only preserved in public the calm they had shown during the fakoda incident but among themselves were not slow in expressing sympathy the reactionary party and some of the lower classes were perhaps not unnaturally pleased to see english pride humbled but the one and only class that really rejoiced at the humiliation was as i have said the christian armenians 
Among Pan-Islamic circles there was a sincere wish for the triumph of the English, for these knew that the interests of the Muslims of South Africa were bound up with theirs, and that though the Muslims had many just grounds of complaint against the treatment accorded them by the colonists and the lack of protection afforded them by the home government, they knew that the tyranny of the colonists was, after all, better than the friendship of the power in this view the majority of the people shared and though the reactionary press thought it good policy to profess a desire for the collapse of british rule and to laud the powers as heroes fighting for liberty and so forth they knew well enough that the powers would have laughed to scorn any idea of granting social or political freedom or equality to any egyptian or Mohammedan, however high his rank. Under the Mamaluks, as we have seen, contrary to the commonly held idea that the people dare not even protest against the injustices by which they were oppressed, it was no unusual thing for them to do so, and if they did not profit more from the power of resistance they possessed, it was because they were too indifferent to or too ignorant of their own interest to defend this as they might have done under mahomed ali and his successors they were not only tongue-tied but enslaved in a far worse manner than they had ever been by the mamaluks under the english they have enjoyed the most perfect liberty of speech a liberty that is not only slowly subjecting itself to the self-restraint that alone can render it as serviceable to their true interests as it ought to be it was but natural therefore that the press for a large part written and conducted by men of no position or influence and actuated by no higher desire than to gain the momentary applause of their readers should put the Eaton's Will Gazette to shame in its own particular line, and that the folly and ineptitude of its articles should make the Egyptians ridiculous in the eyes of all intelligent people. But these are the faults of youth and inexperience and lack of education, and are largely due to the bad example of European papers of little, if any, higher merit slowly but steadily the egyptian press has moved and is still moving towards a worthier standard and the fact that its movement is a spontaneous and voluntary one is an incontestable proof that the egyptians are a people not only capable of but anxious for self-improvement and a people entirely deserving of liberty it is a maxim in mechanics that the weakest link in a chain is a measure of the strength of the whole of the newspaper press of a country i think it may be said that its strength and merit are to be judged by its best so judged we cannot but think well of the egyptian press that the liberty accorded to it is still abused by journals on a par with the lowest type of journalism in europe is to be regretted it is an evil that will eventually cure itself meanwhile the liberty granted to the press has undoubtedly been the chief boon conferred by england upon the country it is a gift that has done more to educate and elevate the people and promote healthy progress than all else or aught else that has been done for the attainment of these ends slowly but surely it is doing the great work accomplished in england mainly through the establishment of sunday and ragged schools the raising of the intellectual standard of the people the formation and nurturing of healthy ambitions and the creation of a higher and purer conception of all the relations of life all that england has done for the financial commercial and general material welfare of the country and of its inhabitants almost immeasurably great and good as this work has been is but a trifle 
to the results that may ultimately spring directly from the liberty given to the press as i have said the progress being made is slow so slow that european critics fail to grasp its real extent and value but it is steady widespread and real a progress that will not be easily checked and one that is doing more to change the character of the egyptians is a healthy life-giving manner than any other influence tending in the same direction the good work that is thus being done is due in the first place to the sound and enlightened views of lord cromer who has persistently refused to be guided or rather misguided by the suggestions of those who would fain see a censorship established by the course he has adopted lord cromer has thrown upon the journalists of the country a degree of responsibility of which though as yet its obligations are not fully recognized by those on whom they lie must tend as is indeed tending to render the press worthy of the trust reposed in it it is due to the sense of this responsibility already felt both by journalists and the public that the serious journalists find themselves compelled more and more to justify the policy they advocate and to maintain it with consistency thus instructed by experience the people are yearly exacting a higher standard of excellence from the press and the demand is being met by a corresponding improvement we must not forget however that the possibilities inherent in lord cromer's wise policy might have still been lying dormant and unproductive if among the egyptians there had been no one to see this and taking them up rendered them in some degree an actuality fortunately the occasion brought the man it was in the year eighteen eighty seven that a small weekly arabic paper styled by the adab was first established at cairo this rapidly becoming known for the ability with which its articles were written continued to grow in favor with the mahomedan public to which it was especially addressed as a journal devoted to science literature and religion until the year eighteen ninety when its editor joined the staff of the daily newspaper the mojad of which three years later he became the sole proprietor from that date onward the mojad progressed rapidly and becoming the recognized organ of the ulema of the azhar took the position it still maintains as the leading arabic and islamic journal not only in egypt but throughout the mohammedan world various journals have been started from time to time in opposition to or rivalry with the mojad but none have ever succeeded in impairing its supremacy from first to last this success has been attained and preserved by the sheikh ali joseph its proprietor and editor well read in all learning that qualifies a man to take his place among the ulema but ignorant of every language save his own the sheikh as a newspaper man and a leader writer is not only foremost among the journalists of the east but one who in his chief merit has few if any rivals among the journalists of the world his paper says mr hartman in his arabic press of egypt is a power to be reckoned with moslems read it with pleasure finding in it what most delights their hearts there they read in a strong well chosen and simple language their own thoughts or rather what they imagine to be their own thoughts for such is the art of the cunning journalist that the unsuspicious readers follows in the track of the writer's thoughts and fancies them to be his own when i add that this man is a man of thought of great self-restraint endowed with patience energy and perseverance i have drawn the picture of one who in any community must exercise a large influence as a journalist 
but amidst a people like the egyptians so little prone to think for themselves must indeed be a power to reckon with as a fact he has done more to guide and mould moslem opinion in egypt than any other ten men that could be named like the historian gabarty of arabic origin he is personally a reserved thoughtful man leading a quiet studious life adverse to ostentation and parade of every kind and yet possessing keen business instincts the position he has won for his journal has been gained by the steady pursuit of the policy which he from the first adopted the love of justice and the desire to promote the interest of islam and of egypt he has again and again had to meet the open hostility of different classes of the people he has been trying to serve for he has not hesitated to advocate unpopular measures and ideals when these have commended themselves to his judgment and yet he is persistently set down by europeans as a fanatic and intriguer recognizing as fully as any man can do the advantages that the english occupation has conferred upon the country he is yet as a moslem compelled to weigh this against the disadvantages due not especially to the presence of the english but to the influence of the european powers generally striving always to hold a just balance never hasty to judge fearless though moderate in the expression of his views he is the one and only journalist in the country who for years past has steadily and with absolute honesty of purpose endeavoured to promote harmony and goodwill between the people and their english rulers the egyptians have long since recognised this there was a time indeed when not a few of them cried out that he had been bought by the english unfortunately europeans understand neither the man nor his policy and seizing upon some extract from his paper as often as not wrested from a qualifying context and possibly written by an outside contributor paint him as a firebrand and fanatic the best gift that england has yet given egypt is then the freedom of the press for this has been and is the influence tending more and more strongly than any other towards the healthy development of the character of the people there are some if not many who claiming to know the country will be inclined to deny this but should not malign counter influence arise to stay the progress now being made i am confident the verdict of the future will justify my view the three healthy influences i have thus described the increased knowledge of european civilization and of the present condition of the islamic world and the development of the arabic press are each stimulating and correcting the other and are those which of all others are working to modify and improve the national character the result they have so far jointly produced has been that the egyptian is learning to take a broader and therefore a healthier view of himself and his surroundings and has acquired new and nobler aspirations his ideals are no longer what they were but a quarter of a century ago and in recognizing this fact he recognizes that the change has been brought about very largely through the english occupation and that is a change for the better nor is the egyptian ungrateful as he is often and unjustly accused of being if his gratitude is not more pronounced unfortunately there is too ample reason for its moderation long years ago my old nurse once showed me a pot of my favorite jam and promised that my watering lips should feast upon it without restraint provider i were a good boy and first took a spoonful of the gregory's powder i can still remember how my lips dried up at the very mention of that most abominable of all the medicines ever thrust upon suffering humanity and i turned with loathing from the jam 
that a moment before had been so luxuriously appetizing let us see what is the gregory's powder that taints the sweetness of the benefits that england has conferred upon egypt end of chapter eighteen healthy influences recorded by gabby cowan in kingston ontario canada Chapter 19 of Bonaparte in Egypt and the Egyptians of Today. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham McMillan. Bonaparte in Egypt and the Egyptians of Today by Haji A. Brown. Chapter 19. Unhealthy Influences. I should have been well contented if it had been possible for me to write this chapter as a parody of that ever-famous one on the snakes of Ireland. Unhappily, there are unhealthy influences in Egypt influences placing difficulties in the way of the English administrators of the country, ever discouraging and disheartening the Egyptian, ever tending to turn him from the path of progress, influences that have been and are holding back the advance that is being made. In my last chapter I spoke of the benefits derived from the liberty of the press. In this I have to speak of the evil it produces, for first and chief of all the unhealthy influences in Egypt is the Makatam, the newspaper that is regarded as the special organ of English interests in Egypt. While yet Sheikh Ali is wholly unknown, three Syrian Christians, who had established a monthly literary magazine at Beirut, decided to transfer it to Cairo. There it acquired a well-deserved popularity it still maintains. Possessed of ability and full of the energy and enterprise that is a characteristic of their race, the proprietors of this monthly saw in the English occupation an opportunity of enlarging their sphere of action and started a daily paper, the Makatam, just a year before the Moyad appeared. The policy that this new journal adopted, and has persistently maintained to the present day, was the twofold one of supporting English interests in Egypt and of attacking Islam and the Turkish Empire on all possible occasions. Caring nothing for their adopted country, and ever mindful of the fact that it was the interference of the European powers that compelled Muhammad Ali to abandon Syria, they entered upon their task with enthusiasm, and, that the Mayad was not long in passing it in popularity, they early succeeded in gaining for the Makatam the position it holds of undoubtedly the ablest of all the Christian journals published in the Arabic language. Save only as to the lines upon which it seeks to promote the policy it advocates, it may indeed justly claim the highest praise for the manner in which it is written and conducted. In the days when the English occupation and the two rival journals, the Moyad and the Makatam, were all still young, Egyptian politics and therefore Egyptian newspapers were run upon purely party lines, and as Dr. Johnson thought he was best fulfilling his mission in seeing that the Whig dogs did not get the best of it, so all who dabbled in any degree with Egyptian politics thought it their bounden duty to admit no good or merit in any who opposed their views. Hence, while the English administrators were still blundering, trying to find their way through the maze of difficulties they had to encounter, and trying first this and then that remedy for the evils they had to contend with, from the newspapers and people of the country they could get no assistance whatever. It was the policy of the Makatam to support the English, and with the editor's primitive ideas they could find no other way of doing this than by lauding with indiscriminate praise everything the English did or proposed to do. It was the policy of the Mayad to decry and depreciate all that the Makatam approved or supported. Each of the two papers was thus pursuing exactly the line most calculated to defeat its own aim and throw discredit on its own cause, for as the praise of the Makatam was constantly being discounted by the admitted failure of the measures it had lustily approved, so the discrimination of the Mayad was belittled by the success of those it had condemned. From that day to this, the Makatam has learned nothing. It pursues the same line today that it did then. It has not been so with the Mayad. Sheikh Ali Youssef was far too able a man to be long in seeing the folly inherent in politics of this puerile type, and he determined to adopt a higher line. It was no easy task he thus set himself. He was still a young man, and as such his abilities received rather stinted acknowledgment from the greybeards, who were the leaders of the Muslim and National Party. His journal was not yet strong enough to choose its own position, and its existence and influence, as well as his own future, depended wholly upon the support he received from self-satisfied, self-willed men, who thought it their province to dictate, and not to learn. And with this difficulty, Sheikh Ali had the graver one of having to find a policy and a method of advocating it that would practically reconcile the almost irreconcilable, like all Egyptians, and indeed all non-Christian Easterns, he held then, as now, 
that of all the European powers, England was the one with which friendship was most possible. It was, however, at the moment the approved policy of the Egyptian National Party to profess a preference for France, and therefore the Muslim papers were expected to hold up France and the French as the friends and allies of Islam. Had Sheikh Ali attacked this view, his rashness would have been the death knell of the Moyad. He saw this clearly, but he was not a man to be deterred by difficulties or daunted by dangers. That which was right and true was right and true, and it was his duty, as one of the ulema, to teach and to preach that which was right and true. But to run amuck against the prevailing prejudices would be to ensure failure. If he were to succeed, it must be by degrees, by the slow and patient conversion of others to his views, by a steady and almost stealthy diffusion of his ideas. In the East, the circulation and writings of a journal are often but little guide to the power and influence really possessed by its editor for an editor is frequently able to accomplish far more by his direct personal influence, outside his journal, than he could by the most earnest or able advocacy of those views in its columns. It was so with Sheikh Ali. There were men of influence who were quite prepared to listen attentively to anything he had to say to them in private, and to accept and adopt his views in the same way, but who would not have tolerated a journal that rashly published the same ideas to the world at large. Starting boldly, yet with due caution, Sheikh Ali set himself to the task of educating his supporters. Slowly, and in sugar-coated pills of homeopathic size, he administered to them minute doses of the ideas he wished them to digest. Slowly, but surely and steadily, he overcame the difficulties before him. One by one, even those who would not consent to the Moyad propagating such ideas, admitted that the Sheikh was right. Time went on, and with its flight of the old fiery spirits of the Nationalist Party, the no-surrender men of the old type gradually died out, and many changes of many kinds came to pass. And still the sheik was struggling with opposition, and still he was steadily gaining ground. But as falling bodies gather speed and force in their descent, so intellectual movements gather force and speed in their ascent. And thus, in spite of all difficulties, difficulties that only undauntable pluck, unwearied patience and ability could face, much less triumph over, the sheik accomplished his purpose, and scarcely knowing how, or why, or indeed that it is so, the Egyptians have adopted the sheik's policy, a policy that may be summed up in the phrase, peace and progress. It would have been well for Egypt, and not less so for British interests, if the editors of the Makatam had followed in the wake of Sheikh Ali. But as I have said, their policy is today what it was at the beginning, the same narrow-minded bigotry in its pro-English partisanship, and the same foolish fanaticism in its anti-Turkish crusade. The true interests of the country, or of their co-religionists, or of the occupation, are all alike sacrificed to their morbid love of wounding and hurting the religious and social sentiments of the Egyptians, or of vaunting their impotent hatred of the Turk. Thus their record is a record of evil, a record of needless difficulties heaped up in the way of the English administrators of the country, of ill-will and animosity excited among the people. The two strongest factors in the formation of Egyptian opinion are, as I have shown, the attachment of the people to their religion and their attachment to the Turkish Empire. Both these sentiments are persistently and willfully outraged by the Makatam. It does not indulge in the rabid rant of the anti-Turkish press in England, but while keeping within the limits of decent language, it loses no opportunity of saying aught that can wound the feelings, offend the prejudices, or excite the anger of the Muslims and it does this as the organ of the English occupation, as a journal universally believed to be largely subsidized by the English, and therefore a journal believed also to be the expression of the real views, aims, and sentiments of the English occupants of the country. Is it any wonder that the Pacific policy, the unbroken respect for Muslim prejudices that Lord Cromer has always shown, should assume in the eyes of the Egyptians the character of a temporary policy? a policy to be abandoned as soon as circumstances should permit the open adoption of the anti-Islamic policy of the avowed organ of English interests? The old reactionary party has almost wholly died out. What remains of it is not less in touch with the real sentiments of the people than is the young Egypt party, that to a certain extent is its successor. But neither of the two parties ever has done, or could do, a tithe of the harm the Makatam is still doing. The attacks of the anti-Turkish press in England the anti-Islamic writings of the late Sir William Muir and other critics affect Muslims in Egypt or elsewhere but little, for it is known that these represent but narrow circles of thought, but that the local journal, which is spoken of by Englishmen themselves as the English organ, 
should be forever out heroding the efforts of those circles has and could have but one result a profound distrust of the professions made as to the true aim and object of the occupation this is the key to the lack of enthusiasm the want of gratitude for which the egyptians are so often rebuked men like mr dicey may build up theories of their own on what to the englishman at home may seem at least plausible arguments but they are only drawing herrings across the trail of the true explanation thus the journal which as mr hartman says has gained favor with lord cromer has been of all other causes the one which has most freely and wantonly strewn his path with needless difficulties face to face with the anti-islamic sentiments of the english organ in egypt it is utterly hopeless to expect muslims in egypt or elsewhere to regard the english occupation with any other feelings than those of distrust had the makatam been conducted upon conciliatory lines had it striven to guide the english with the healthy honest advice it could have given had it endeavoured to promote an intelligent appreciation of the good work that has been done and is doing it would have rendered a service of incalculable value to the english and to the egyptians alike and with their undoubted ability its editors would have taken their place among the greatest benefactors of the country as it is they have wrought no service and much ill and may pride themselves upon having been the greatest obstacle in the way of the progress that has been made the one thing that lord cromer has needed most of all throughout his long brilliant and self-devoting struggle has been the cordial cooperation of the people the one thing that more than all else has tended to deprive him of that cooperation has been the anti-islamic attitude of the arabic organ of the occupation had i been writing this a year ago it would have been possible for me to say that happily the growing confidence of the people in lord cromer and in the intentions of the english government was steadily if very slowly undoing and counteracting the evil thus done unfortunately i cannot say so to-day events have occurred that have almost wholly scattered all the fruit of the progress that have been made in this direction we have seen that little inclined as the egyptians were to welcome any prolongation of the occupation they had accepted the evacuation of Fakoda as at least a temporary resolution of all the doubts and uncertainties that had worried them for so long it was what those who understood them might have expected they're essentially an impulsive people in every emergency their decision is made without hesitation or faltering too often without consideration or thought of any kind but the impulse of the moment to such a people nothing could be more trying more irritating that they should be kept on from month to month and year to year helplessly waiting on the decision of others or on a development of events they were powerless to control this cause was alone almost sufficient to stay all progress social or political prior to the evacuation of Fakoda. for years they had been waiting to hear the verdict and when it came the mere fact of the ending of their long anxious suspense took much of the sting from the bitterness the verdict itself might otherwise have created and apart from all political and religious feeling there were two causes that greatly intensified the egyptian's burden during that trying wait these were his love of freedom and his love of peace and concord as an individual there is nothing the egyptian prizes more than his freedom not his liberty but his freedom not the legal and formal admission of his rights but the absence of restraint that gives a sense of unfettered ease not the liberty that is the birthright of every british subject be he master or man but the freedom the master enjoys as master for this the egyptian can and will make many sacrifices even bartering much of his liberty that he may enjoy it and this freedom he could not enjoy while yet the fate of the country was in the balance reticent to his nearest kin in the expression of his thoughts he yet loves to speak freely within the limits he allows himself and this he could not do while yet he had to guard against exciting the animosity of rival parties and interests he was neither sitting on the wall nor trimming on the broad general question at issue he was clear in his own mind and did not hesitate to say what he thought but he could not get beyond that he could not discuss men and matters as he should have liked to have done once the die was cast and the supremacy of the english settled he was no longer tossed on the horns of the dilemma which of the two evils is the least but free to take a side and say as he would this thing is good or bad it was the same with his love of peace and concord hospitable and kind-hearted ever ready to surrender his own comfort and convenience not only for his friends but for the stranger the universally prevalent discord was to him a real grievance so real that he would have accepted almost any solution provided only that it offered a reasonable hope of the re-establishment of harmony when after the revolt of cairo and again after the siege truce was declared the people of the town accepted it loyally and kept it faithfully they submitted to the rule of the french most unwillingly and only under compulsion 
but, having done so, they adhered without murmur or quibble to the pact. It was the same after Marchand had left the Nile behind him on his homeward way. Finding themselves definitely under the English, they accepted the inevitable, and were, as they still are, ready to loyally, honestly, and fully discharge their acceptance. There was therefore a complete change in the attitude of the people toward the English, and it was not unnatural for them to look for a corresponding change on the part of the English. No such change occurred. Up to Fakoda, the Egyptians had been courted and flattered by the anti-English Europeans in the country. The English, with a few rare exceptions, held aloof from them. After Fakoda, the anti-English quietly dropped the Egyptians. The English maintained their attitude of indifference, and to the Egyptians seemed rather to assume a haughtier air, to adopt more and more the tone of conquerors in a hostile land, to treat the people as enemies, and as enemies scarce worthy of a thought. The Boer War broke out, and in the torrent of disasters that pursued the British troops, the Egyptians found excuse for the reserved and chilling manners of the English. But the closing of the war brought no change, and the Egyptians began to ask themselves, of what avail is it that we seek to conciliate the English when they make no response? Nonetheless, they adhered to the position they had taken, and hoped, as they still do, that Englishmen would wake up to a sense of the injustice with which they were acting. Meanwhile, the utter failure of the English to understand the real attitude and feelings of the people towards them lends weight and force to the evil wrought by the Makatam. If the Egyptians ask, the English are really anxious to benefit us, how is it that they thus hold us at arm's length? How can they benefit us without knowing or understanding what are our hopes, our wishes, our aspirations, our prejudices, our predilections? And how can they know aught of these while they sedulously avoid all intercourse, friendship, or familiarity with us? But it is not simply English aloofness of which complaint is made, but the vulgar and aggressive self-assertion, the rudeness and want of common civility so many are constantly guilty of in their accidental intercourse with the people of the country. These are things complained of by Europeans, and, as is well known, in Europe as well as in Egypt. The Englishman flatters himself that these complaints are due to envy and fanaticism. Nothing could be more contrary to the fact. It is the expression not of envy, but of contempt, the utter scorn of the man of the world for the uncultivated boor. That this is so is proved by the fact that this antipathy is felt and shown only towards two classes of Englishmen, classes that have, unfortunately, of late years grown, as other unhealthy excrescences are prone to do, rapidly, the cads and those who ape those under the guise of good form. Men of the latter type are much too numerous in Egypt, and may claim the credit of placing endless difficulties and obstacles in the way of Lord Cromer and English interests. The men who have made the empire were men cast in another mould. They were masterful men, men who could and did command respect through inherent force of character and ability, men born to command, men whom others followed and obeyed as a privilege. The men I speak of are of a different type. Lacking in the high qualities of their predecessors, and sensible of their defects, these seek to obtain by arrogance the respect they cannot command. With many it is their misfortune. The true cad owes his contemptible character to his narrow training and the want of a healthy, manly brain. Born of a butcher, by a bishop bred, how high he holds his haughty head. But the great majority of those who, by their caddish behavior, like the ill birds of the old adage, foul their own nests, have not this excuse to offer. They sin willfully, deliberately choosing to act as cads in toadying compliance with what the moneyed cads whose society they crave are pleased to consider good form. Like the pariah dogs of the street, fawning upon all who perchance may have a bone to throw them, and snapping and snarling at all others, the true cad can never rise above his brainless, soulless self. But the man whose caddish manners are as the mud-stained garb of he who has rolled in the gutter is, often enough, at heart a sound and healthy-minded man, a brave and honest gentleman, a lion wrapped in the skin of an ass. Verily a wondrous spectacle, most strangely reversing the old fable. I have seen and known such men in times of stress and danger to be all that men should be, and I have marveled to see them return to the old, false, lying lives. Happily the evil is one that will not last. Already he who has eyes to see may see that once more a great revolution is in progress. The old English aristocracy of men who ruled at home and abroad by right of their high qualities is fast dying out. The stately old oak that has weathered the storms and stresses of so many long years is withering and perishing smothered under the unhealthy growth of parasites that are sucking its life sap. The old aristocracy is almost gone. The new, with nothing but its money-bags to sustain it, has not succeeded, and never can succeed, to the political or social power of its predecessors. And these, therefore, are passing on to the strong men of the plebeian world, 
men who, without the polish, have much, if not all, the virtues of the empire-building classes of the past. For the last time that history will ever record a government that might by any just use of terms call itself conservative, as sat in the English House of Commons. Look back at the life of France, ere yet the hurricane swirl of the red flag of revolution had scattered its aristocracy, as a fierce autumn storm scatters the lingering leaves of the bygone summer. The lesson is an old, old one, one taught in many pages of history, one coming down to us from those far-off days wherein men first heard the proverb, Pride goeth before destruction, and then haughty spirit before a fall. The evil is one that will not last. Pharaohs, Ptolemies, Mamelukes, Caesars, Bonapartes, Patricians, feudal lords, aristocracies. In short, all cadisms and flunkeyisms and falsities and other abominations, however they may flourish and thrive for the moment, if it were not for the clamor and blare of their own conceit, would ever hear time tolling the passing bell that tells of their open graves. Meanwhile, in Egypt and elsewhere, the two cads, the real and the mock, are among the most potent and the most active of the enemies of England and the English Empire, and the most costly luxury that the easy-going British taxpayer allows himself. This is so, for the ill-will and hatred that these excite leads thousands who might be the friends and promoters of English interests to devote themselves to hindering and counteracting those interests in every possible way. And this same dislike serves as a bond of union between the enemies of England everywhere, it is doing more than all else to unite the people of India of all races and creeds in one compact nationally, and is elsewhere, and in other manners, working evil for the empire. There are other unhealthy influences retarding the work of the administration of the country and the progress of its people. Notable among these is the education question, or rather questions, for there are several. The system adopted in the government schools is objected to as tending to the formation of a class separated from the rest of the people by special aims and interests, and having standards of life, of morals, of religion, entirely different from those of their own kith and kin. A class whose manners, customs, and habits are at variance with those of all their countrymen and co-religionists. A class slowly but surely drifting more and more apart from all who do not belong to it and which is thus losing all possibility of exerting the healthy influence upon others, it should be easy for them to do with the advantages they possess, or of becoming the leaven in the mass, tending to raise the whole. There are men who have passed through the schools who are doing good work, but they are few in number, and the good they are doing is largely due to their having been subjected to influences counteracting the pernicious effects of their school training. A part of the evil thus charged to the schools, government, and others is that they are destructive of the religious sentiments and aspirations of their pupils. They do not convert these to Christianity, nor, as is so often said, to atheism. But they do lead them to despise the duties of their religion, to mock at its obligations, and to ignore its social and moral restraints, and thus destructive of all that goes to make the Muslim a worthy citizen and man. Gives them nothing in exchange and leaves them to go through life like wanton children, drawn hither and thither by every passing whim or fancy. Is it a retribution that for the most part they go to swell the ranks of the anti-English party? The direct result of this evil is that the whole of the people are being gradually divided into two classes, the so-called, and very much miscalled, educated class, and the, by contrast of terms, uneducated class, the class which, by the perversity of facts, includes almost all who are really and truly educated, those who have had moral and religious training, have been taught to comprehend the most essential fact that can be taught, that every man has duties to perform, that he is not an isolated unit with nothing to think of but his own pleasure and profit, but one of the vast congregation of humanity, whose members are linked together by the recognition of the obligations of their common duties to God and their fellow man. It is true that the schools give their pupils lessons to this effect, but all the circumstances that surround the giving of those lessons, and the whole tendency of the life of the schools, is to render these lessons ineffective, mere tasks to be learned as part of the daily routine, pretty theories to be applauded and admired, not verities to be believed and put in practice. And since the education given in the schools is held up as the very lifeblood of all progress, it follows that all that is best in the country turns aside and says, If this is progress, then give us stagnation. If to be an educated, advanced, enlightened man means to be a man who ridicules duty, despises religion, and mocks at piety, then, in the name of God, let us remain ignorant, so only that we still worship him, and strive as best we may to fulfill what we believe to be his law. 
nor are the schools the only things mainly if not wholly due to the occupation that offend moslem sentiment and thus retard progress and decrease the sympathy there might be between the people and their rulers i can only just mention two or three of these without staying to comment upon them as perhaps the most active among many others the sale and consumption of intoxicating drinks in the open streets the almost unchecked promenading of brazen-faced european women in the busiest and most crowded thoroughfares the open eating drinking and smoking during the ramadan fast quarantine and other sanitary measures frequently trenching upon moslem sentiment such as restrictions upon the pilgrimage and the holding of the religious festivals of the people these things are to the egyptian as the breaking of the sabbath to the scotchman what would the scotch sabbatarians say if a number of englishmen were to settle among them and insist upon carrying on business opening the theatres and breaking the sabbath in a dozen other openly offensive ways would they be considered unreasonable if they protested would they be regarded as ungrateful because they did not thank the invaders for the financial benefit they were conferring on the country yet when the egyptians protest however faintly against such outrages upon their sentiments they are told that they are unreasonable backward unenlightened narrow-minded and fanatical there is another influence for evil to which my reference to sabbatarianism naturally leads me the christian missions and their agents of the magnificent social and humanitarian work done by christian missions and christian missionaries in india no one has a higher opinion than i have years ago i spent a couple of days in one of the wildest parts of the bengal presidency as the guest of a grand old man who with his wife a worthy mate for him were dwelling as they had been for years among the semi-savage tribes of the jungle isolated from all the comforts and conveniences of civilization seeing no european faces other than their own save once or twice in the year when the commissioner made his annual rounds a grand old couple laboring with endless self-devotion for the good of the stolid stunted-brained almost naked people more than half savage in nature and habit and by dint of tedious toil and never resting effort lifting some few of these out of the depths and winning them to humanity i have met many men and many women in my life but none that have claimed from me a more sincere or lasting respect than these but there are missionaries and missionaries and in moslem lands there are some who do much ill and not less by their speech than by the literature they circulate in this they are backed up by missionary and other journals which take a pleasure in representing islam as a religion that inculcates bigotry and fanaticism i have myself heard a missionary undertake to prove to mohammedan hearers that unless they hated christians they were no better than infidels taking passages from the koran ignoring their context and the teaching and interpretation placed upon them by the orthodox ulema he had little difficulty in apparently justifying his promise with the result that some of his hearers went away filled for the first time with the conception that it was their duty to hate christians such incidents are by no means rare and it would be difficult to estimate the mischief they do a few years ago the late well-known canon mccall flooded the press at home for a brief time with speeches and writings of this kind every word of what he wrote was reproduced in oriental languages and did far more to excite fanaticism than any of the most inflammatory articles that have ever appeared in any portion of the moslem press how often have pan-islamists advocating friendship with england and other european nations as a means of advancement for moslems been met with the reply but they themselves say that it is our duty to hate them so the bigotry that takes unholy pleasure in misrepresenting the truth reacts with fatal effect upon the cause it pretends to serve the unhealthy influences of which i have spoken so far all originate from sources outside the direct action of the government none the less they are perhaps all influences that it lies within the province of the government to correct and so long as they are permitted to flourish so long will their existence be regarded by the people as subjects of grievance against the rulers of the land it may be and is said that some of these matters are things in which it is wiser for the government not to interfere there is much to be said on both sides but in all matters thus admitting of discussion there cannot be the least doubt that the deciding consideration should be the effect they produce upon the people at large that which would be best in a country like england the people of which have long been accustomed to look upon themselves as the final arbiters in all questions is entirely out of place in a country like egypt in which almost for the first time the people find themselves absolutely impotent to enforce their wills in any matter whatever under the mamelukes as we have seen they had this power and they did not lose it until mohammed ali had succeeded in enslaving them if they exercised the power they possessed but rarely to a limited degree and mostly in a futile manner this was largely due to the ignorance that prevailed and to the violent methods of suppression to which their attempts in this direction were always liable 
Today the people no longer suffer from the crass ignorance of those of the past. The most illiterate peasant in the country is an enlightened man compared to his ancestor of the 18th century. Increased knowledge has brought, as it should do, increased desires and aspirations, and there is nothing that could testify to the sterling merits of the Egyptian character more than the fact that these desires and aspirations are such as the most enlightened cannot but approve. That the people, as a body, are not yet capable of giving their new-found ideas a healthy, practical issue without the aid of those more advanced than themselves is nothing to their discredit. The path of political progress is a long and difficult one to tread, and it is trodden most successfully by those who, like the Egyptians, advance diffidently rather than daringly, and the Egyptians have made such progress as entitles them to be heard. As yet, however, they have no adequate means of making known their views. The press of the country is yearly filling better and better its duty in this respect. But under the occupation, the true voice of the people, the ulema, who in all times and in all countries have always been the natural and most fitting representatives of the people, has been, and is, practically silent. Among Muslims, the authority of the ulema is greater than that of the ruling prince of their country. And the ulema, drawn from among the body of the people, have always exercised the beneficent influence Macaulay has ascribed to the Catholic priesthood, for, like it, the conditions of their existence are such that, as Macaulay expressed it, they invert the relations between oppressor and oppressed, and force the hereditary master to kneel before the spiritual tribunal of the hereditary serf. So in the days of the Mamelukes we see the people going for the redress of their wrongs to the ulema, and these going to the bays, and rarely failing to obtain some concession. Since the English occupation, this primitive, but in its essentials most complete, measure of representative government has been in abeyance. The ulema are no longer regarded as the spokesmen of the nation. Their voices are heard only indirectly, and then not as speaking for the people, but as those of individuals. It is quite true that the people of today belong to a generation that has never had any experience of conditions other than those practically such as now exist, but that they do feel the need for some such system is certain and it is their sense of this need that is giving force and body to the demand made by some of the reformers for the introduction of a representative government after the pattern of those being in Europe. For this the people have no real desire. What they want is what their ancestors had, an informal but ever-present means of making their wishes known to their rulers. No formally established body could supply their need. They have now the legislative council, which is intended expressly to be the voice of the people, but while, like the press, this is yearly growing in merit and utility, it is not, and never can be, to the people that which the ulema have been in the past, and should always be to the people of a Mohammedan country, the representatives to whom these can go at any time and in any manner to seek counsel and advice, and to consult with, that they may act as their intermediaries with the administrative body of the country. It may seem to the reader that in my last paragraph I have been wandering somewhat widely from the subject of unhealthy influences, but it is not so, for the Egyptian sense of their inability to make their wishes known is unquestionably not only an unhealthy influence, but one that is very steadily growing. The press does much to instruct the government as to what are the thoughts and feelings moving the people, but at best it can only do this as the press of other countries does, rather as the expression of individuals or classes than of the masses. And while it thus acts as spokesman for the people to only a limited extent, it can never be what is most needed an intermediary that can not only speak for them, but bring them a reply. End of chapter 19, Unhealthy Influences Recording by Graham McMillan, San Diego, California Chapter 20 of Bonaparte in Egypt and the Egyptians of Today this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham McMillan. Bonaparte in Egypt and the Egyptians of Today by Haji A. Brown. Chapter 20. More Unhealthy Influences. We come now to consider unhealthy influences arising either from the present constitution of the administration of the country or directly or indirectly from the action of the government. That we may understand the position taken by the Egyptians with respect to these matters, it is necessary to see what are the conditions they consider the English administrators of the country are bound to fulfill to justify official statements as to the objects and extent of the occupation. These, as seen by the Egyptians, may be summed up in one sentence, and are 
that the country is to be governed with due regard to the rights of the sultan as sovereign the religion of the people the general interests of the country and with a view to the ultimate independence of the native government on all of these points there is much dissatisfaction of the first two i have spoken in the last chapter as to the third it is commonly admitted that the commercial and financial interests of the country are well cared for and administered but the criticism is frequent that this is so not for the sake of the country or of its people but for the sake of the european interests involved the englishman's sense of and devotion to duty are recognized by all save perhaps a few but the common feeling is that in egypt this devotion is not stimulated by any feeling of duty or obligation to the country or its people but solely by the desire to perpetuate the occupation englishmen of the cad type of which i have spoken including unfortunately too many military officers and government officials by their behavior towards the people do much to justify this conclusion and if one may judge by their action in public places even seem anxious to do so that there are englishmen in the country and in the government service who are of a very different type is fully recognized and the egyptian is too just and too generous in sentiment to confound these with those yet he cannot but feel that while such conduct is allowed apparently unrestrained and that even the men of the better type make no open protest he can draw no other conclusion but the one that the englishmen who really are honest in their desire to serve the country and conciliate its people are not only few in number but small in influence it may be said that this is at most but a sentimental grievance and that the solid good done in the country far outweighs or should outweigh such causes of complaint those who think so know nothing of human nature and might perhaps benefit by studying ruskin a little nor must it be overlooked that with this as with other unhealthy influences it is not the direct or isolated influence of each that is to be considered but its cumulative effect as one of a large number of forces tending in the same direction as a thousand feeble threads that an infant might snap one by one scarce conscious of the effort it was making when united may form a cable that will drag a mighty ship against wind and tide so these little threads of discord united serve to draw the ship of state into troubled waters it is often made a subject of complaint that the egyptians fail to appreciate the great work that has been done and is being done in the country this is true to some but only to some extent it is very much less true than it is thought to be that the egyptians should largely fail to comprehend the englishman and his work is the outcome of that irreconcilability of eastern and western ideas and mental processes i spoke of in my first chapter and the egyptian in his endeavor to understand the englishman has to encounter difficulties far greater than those that baffle the englishman who seek to understand the egyptian the englishman in egypt can if he will place himself more or less in direct touch with all classes of the egyptians and can study them at his leisure the egyptian has no such opportunity of studying the englishman he is barred from any but the scantiest and most formal social intercourse with the English, and, even in this, as in his other efforts, he is perplexed and bewildered by the ever-varying aspects the English character presents. For to the Egyptian the Englishman is a veritable Proteus, as inconstant as the unstable element he boasts of ruling. Now an imperialist, and anon a little Englander, now a courteous gentleman, and again a braggard cad, now an earnest man of lofty aim, and again a flannelled fool of witless brain now commanding respect and esteem for his sterling qualities and again exciting contempt and censure by his ill-bred manners and in these varying shapes and forms the egyptian sees but little of the englishman and that little for the most part amid surroundings that confuse his vision and disturb his judgment what wonder then that he should be at a loss to reconcile the conflict between official statements and private views between friendly words and unfriendly acts yet it is one of the most promising of auguries that by the mere force of his own generous spirit of tolerance and his desire to be just the egyptian is slowly solving the problem for himself is sifting the wheat from the chaff learning to recognize that which is best and truest in english character and politics to wholly despise the cad for what he is and to appreciate the manliness and merits of the self-respecting englishman of all ranks and grades if englishmen in egypt cared to do so they might easily learn so much at least of the character of the people and would learn that the egyptian can and does appreciate merit that while he is ever lenient and forbearing towards the faults of ignorance he can and does most heartily despise those of perversity of character and that if he so constantly ignores the rudeness to which he is subjected it is because he looks upon those guilty of them as men beneath reproach naturally reticent 
the little familiarity he has with englishmen makes him hesitate to speak to them with even the freedom he extends to other europeans how can it be otherwise when he is in constant fear only too well justified by unpleasant experience of the snub direct of a contemptuous or offensive response and this evil is greatest in the official world egyptian ministers are placed at the head of all departments of the government but it is the english adviser who is the real minister as a matter of simple indisputable fact there is no egyptian government in existence this is a constant complaint of the people the ministers and the whole official world are but the expedient servants of the advisers whose words are law it is useless to tell the ministers or others that their candid advice would be appreciated valued and possibly acted upon that i believe is the truth but it is most certainly the truth that the egyptian entirely and unconditionally believes that were he to accept the assurance he receives he would find himself playing gil blas to the englishman's archbishop the english seaman has it as the cardinal point of all of his duty to obey orders though you break owners absolute implicit obedience to his captain's command even if it means the immediate destruction of the ship that is his ideal of duty and it is the ideal that prevails among the Egyptian officials of today. It is said that these officials have no power of initiative, that they are incapable of justly criticizing the measures and methods adopted in their departments. Possibly those who think so would alter their views if they could hear the criticisms of these same officials when they discuss these matters in Egyptian circles. But under such a system as this it is, of course, impossible for the Egyptian to learn to govern his country on sound administrative lines. No trade, business, or profession of any kind is taught, or could be taught, in this way. You cannot make a carpenter or an engineer by putting an apprentice to watch the work of others, however expert these may be. If he is to learn, tools must be put in his hand, and he must not only be shown how to use them, but must be taught why he is to use them in this or that way, and in no other. And the work of governing a country can only be taught in the same way. The Egyptians see this, though it must be admitted that, like the average apprentice who has made some little progress, they are apt to overrate their knowledge and ability, and to fancy that they are quite able to act as master workmen and teachers. No one who has any knowledge of the English seaman and his training can have failed to see that the great merit of the handyman, as indeed of all seafaring men, is that they are invariably taught the reason why. In pulling and hauling on a rope, in letting it go, in holding on to it. In all of these simple actions he is guided not only by the knowledge of which is the best and most proper way to do them, but also by the knowledge of the reason why that way is the best. And with that knowledge and the mental training it gives, he is ready at a moment's notice not only to pull and haul and let go and hold fast, with the utmost economy of labor and the utmost efficiency of reason, but to modify his method of doing any of these things to suit any possible emergency or special situation he may have to deal with. Every seafaring man recognizes that it may at any moment be a matter of life and death to him and all on board a ship that some one of the crew should have had or should not have had this training, and so every man on board is ever ready to help and aid in the training. Does it not seem reasonable that this same spirit should prevail amongst all who form the crew of the ship of state? That every one who has a hand in guiding or working that ship should reflect that its safety and good working are only to be secured by the intelligent efficiency of all concerned? The man who is the chief of a government department should, like the captain of a ship, be entitled to instant, unhesitating, unquestioning obedience from all under his command. But, having this, is it not his own interest and an absolutely necessary condition for efficient working that he should see that the obedience is based upon an intelligent comprehension of the principles by which the administration is guided? A government that is not conducted in this way may attain for the moment good results but it is, and can be, nothing more than a mere temporary makeshift, for it must depend entirely upon the personal qualities of the man at its head. I have now to touch upon some matters that have attracted almost worldwide notice, and have wrought much evil. Of these, the first to produce a noticeably ill effect was the trial of Manchawi Pacha. Charged with having caused some men to be flogged with a view to extorting from them a confession as to the theft of a bull belonging to his highness, the Khedive, the Paca was arrested, tried, and convicted, and sent to prison as an ordinary prisoner. His arrest caused intense excitement throughout the country, and among all classes. During the Arabia revolt, he had, with great risk to himself, given the utmost protection to Europeans of all nationalities and creeds, and had gathered all he could of these in his own palace, and there guarded them in safety until the danger had passed. 
For the services he had thus rendered, he was given the official thanks of almost all the powers of Europe. Whatever his faults or errors may have been, he was, therefore, a man entitled to the most lenient judgment from all Europeans. The whole press of the country, excepting the English organs, took up his case, and while none condoned or in any way sought to justify his offence, they all pleaded that this was a case in which common gratitude demanded mercy. Unfortunately, there was only too much to be said on the other side, and the Paca had therefore to undergo the three months' imprisonment to which he was sentenced. The trial was intended not only to punish a case of wrongdoing, but to impress upon the people the fact that the law was strong enough to protect the poorest and weakest against the richest and the most influential, and upon minor officials that no excuse would be taken for gross neglect of their duty. That the trial has largely had the desired results is certain, but two causes contributed to lessen in some degree the effect produced. In the first place, the Egyptian, while accepting the theory of even-handed justice, and one law for all, which is indeed an essential part of the teaching of Islam, has so long been accustomed to see that teaching ignored in practice that he has come to look upon the strict administration of justice as an injustice, and thus clings to the old fallacy which, if I am not greatly mistaken, under English law still entitles a peer of the realm to the luxury of a silk rope, should he be so unfortunate as to incur the penalty of death by hanging. The other cause sprang from the Egyptians' habit of attributing all the acts of public men to their personal feelings and desires, a vice that is a constant source of evil and one of the greatest obstacles in the way of progress, not only in Egypt, but throughout the East, utterly destroying, as it does, the growth of anything like a healthy and vigorous public spirit. The vice is one not unknown in home politics, but it is there less prolific of evil, for the sterling common case of the people teaches them to weigh acts and deeds by their intrinsic qualities, and not by mere surmises as to the motives of the actors or doers. In Egypt there is, I think, a tendency towards improvement in this direction. As I have said, the people are learning to think. They are less prone to cling to the first idea that presents itself to their minds, as being necessarily the first and last worthy of consideration. And they have thus made one step towards healthy progress, one, too, that must lead to others. One and all of the unhealthy influences I have described were in force and were marring the good will that should exist between the two peoples. And yet, in spite of all, the Egyptians, balancing the good with the evil, buried their dissatisfaction under hopes of better days to come, and a future recognition by the English of their true spirit. So evident was it that the people really desired to conciliate their rulers, to cooperate with them, and accept their guidance and control in all things, that Lord Cromer announced that the time had come when the army of occupation might be safely and wisely decreased. At once a panic cry went up from a portion of the English colony. Everyone in the country knew that the few who really disbelieved Lord Cromer's assurance that the measure he had proposed was a perfectly safe one were in a hopeless minority. But there were many who, without the least sense of possible danger, had very strong reasons for opposing any reduction of the garrison. Everyone who has lived in a garrison town can understand this. The withdrawal of a single battalion of English troops from Cairo or Alexandria is a very serious matter to many very excellent people and to a great many people who are by no means excellent in any sense of the word. Unfortunately for these, their interests cannot be allowed to control state affairs, and these therefore swelled the chorus of alarm, probably with no thought that in doing their best to protect their own interests, they were doing much ill. The Egyptians, as might be expected, received Lord Cromer's announcement with unqualified pleasure. It was the first recognition of the efforts they had honestly been making to promote goodwill, and they were grateful for it, though the warmth of their gratitude was lessened by the violent opposition to the measure and the unjust and unfounded charges of fanaticism and hatred to the English brought against them. Nonetheless, Lord Cromer's action in this matter was an influence wholly for good and an influence that did more to strengthen and extend English influence in the country than the addition of an army corps to its garrison could possibly do. All then was going well. There was every possible reason to accept Lord Cromer's optimistic view of the position when the Tabah incident occurred, and, like a sudden gale, almost sundered the graft that was fast tending to unite the aims and hopes of the two peoples. News was received in Egypt that Turkish troops had occupied Tabah near the northern end of the west coast of the Gulf of Aqaba, a post that lies well within the Egyptian frontier. To the Egyptian, however, Egypt is bounded by the Suez Canal. He knows that the peninsula of Sinai is part of the Khedivial territory, but he takes no interest in it whatever. 
When, therefore, it was announced that an ultimatum had been sent to the Sultan, the one and only point that for the moment troubled the people was the possibility of a war between Turkey and England. That was the last thing that they wanted, and the gratuitously bellicose tone of the pro-English press raised an alarm throughout the country. The people could see no excuse or reason for the peremptory demands of the English. There was no Turkish army at or near the place in dispute, and if the possession of it was really important to Egyptian interests, it was a question that might be settled by discussion, and was in no sense a pressing or urgent one. Why should the English be in such a hurry to pick a quarrel with the Sultan if they had no ulterior aims in view? All the old fears as to the real aim of the occupation were reawakened. Have not all the rulers of Egypt sought the conquest of Syria and the Hejaz? Was not this the object of the English? And there were not wanting those who held that the aim of the English was to stop the construction of the railway to the Hejaz. So little did the people know of the question at issue, that many believed Taba to be a station on the route of the new railway to El Medina, and that what the English really wanted was to secure the control of that route. These and many other ideas were freely circulated and discussed, and rumors of the wildest kind were echoed throughout the bazaars. The English had landed troops on the Syrian coast. A vast army was on its way from Turkey. The Arabs of Arabia were assembling for the protection of the holy lands of Islam. Nothing was too absurd to be repeated or believed. As to what was actually occurring, the people had no means of knowing, and while the great majority could not, of course, understand the interests involved, it could and did understand that the English were threatening to make war on the Sultan, and that those to whom it looked for guidance held that it was not in the interests of Egypt, but in those of England, that the war was to be made. What more natural than that there should be excitement in the country? And seeing this, the pro-English press took the very course common sense should have taught it to avoid, and began crying out about fanaticism and pan-Islamism thus throwing oil into the fire that had begun to smolder. That the real attitude of the people was wholly and entirely misunderstood by the English generally is beyond question. The one thing that the Egyptians were wishing for was the avoidance of war. The one thing that had given birth to the excitement that arose was the fear that war could not be averted, that the English were determined upon forcing the Sultan's hand. The one question the Egyptians were asking themselves was not, what shall we do if the war breaks out, but how can war be prevented? Had it not been for the attacks of the pro-English press upon Muslim sentiment and the oft-repeated statements made as to unrest in the country, no other thought would have occurred to the people. Those who understood the questions at issue would have felt, as they did and do, aggrieved by the action taken by the English, but they would have given their thought no open utterance, and would have trusted to time to see their wishes realized. There was, therefore, absolutely no unrest in the country, for I take it that unrest implies a desire for, or tendency towards, action and this is precisely what did not exist. Agitation, uneasiness, and excitement were visible clearly enough, but unrest? No. But the wanton and utterly unprovoked anti-Islamic tone of the pro-English press added one more to the unhealthy influences at work in hindering the progress it should be the first aim of that press to promote. And once more the Egyptian showed his self-control and gave proof of his desire to live in peace and harmony with all. Had this not been so, the consequences might have been serious, on the one hand, the anger of a people naturally hasty and impulsive was being awakened. On the other, a vague, unreasoning fear was beginning to seize the colonists generally. Fear is a failing that shows itself with many faces and in many phases. There is the timid fear that starts back, even at the sound himself had made, the panic fear that overwhelms men's reason and sends them madly fleeing they know not where or how, the cowardly fear that palsies the arm, paralyzes the brain, and turns men into craven, cowering creatures from whom all mankind has fled. And there is the fear that urges a man to wild, unreflecting action, to strike, lest he be struck. The fear of the unbalanced mind, that in the sudden presence of apparent danger, loses its self-control. The fear of the brave man, who for the moment has lost his presence of mind. This was the fear that was seizing many in Egypt when the Taba excitement was at its height. The cry of alarm that had been raised when the reduction of the army of occupation had been proposed had disturbed the minds of many. Good folk who cared nothing for politics, but much for their own peace and comfort. The weather was hot, heavy, brain-heating, and enervating. Had it been otherwise, people would not have lost their heads and begun calling for an immediate increase of the army of occupation. It is true that at the prospect of a war between the English and Turkey, some of the lower classes had spoken vaingloriously of what the Muslims would do. But that was an incident that no European, knowing the people and living among them, thought of as anything but amusing. Yet many Europeans living in the country, but, as indeed the great majority of them are, wholly out of touch with the people, 
scarcely ever meeting or speaking with an Egyptian, living entirely among Europeans, their servants even not being natives, but Barbarine Negroes, the most fanatical, bigoted, anti-English class in the country, as much out of touch with the Egyptians as the Europeans themselves. These Europeans became seriously alarmed and made their voices heard in the papers and elsewhere. So the cry of danger was echoed and re-echoed, even in official documents, until the announcement was made that the army of occupation was to be increased, and then, their end attained, the agitators began to admit that, after all, the danger from Egyptian fanaticism was a remote and far from pressing one. The truth is that the danger had been a very serious one. The agitation among the European colonists had begun to react upon the people of the country, and while there was no unrest among these, in the sense in which I have used the word, the excitement that was growing was such that the real gravity of the position was rather under than overstated in Lord Cromer's report upon the incident. At any moment the excitement that prevailed might have been turned by an unlucky incident into unrest of a deplorable and disastrous character. Happily, the collapse of the agitation among the colonists reacted upon the people as strongly as the agitation itself had done. Seeing that the Europeans no longer feared an outbreak of hostilities, they themselves became reassured, for the cessation of the agitation among the Europeans was to them evidence that there was no longer any intention of forcing war upon the Sultan, and that the English were as anxious for peace as they were. Hardly had the heat of this incident passed when the country was startled by the report of the Denshawi affair. Telegrams appeared in the papers stating that English officers had been attacked and killed by some of the Fellahin. The Muslim papers, in publishing the telegrams, expressed regret that such an incident had occurred, hoping that the report was exaggerated, but withheld all comment until the facts should be more fully known. Not so the pro-English press. This at once broke out about the fanaticism rampant in the country, demanded an exemplary punishment, and the instant ordering of reinforcements for the army of occupation. Everywhere, among all classes, the excitement became intense, but the first full account of the affair published calmed the minds of all but a section of the English colony. There had been no murder. The Fellaheen had interfered to prevent some English officers shooting pigeons close to their village, and had become very excited when a gun belonging to one of the officers went off, and a native woman was accidentally wounded. The officers were attacked by the people and severely beaten with heavy sticks, and some of them carried as prisoners, with much ill-treatment, to the village. One of them, who had been badly beaten, had set out for the camp and was found dead on the road at a considerable distance from the village, his death being due, as medical evidence proved, to the combined effects of the injuries received and exposure to the sun. This was the case, as it was heard and understood, in Cairo. All the press condemned the Fellaheen, but, with the exception of the pro-English press, recognized that the affair was simply one of those unhappy occurrences that take place in all countries, and had nothing whatever to do with fanaticism. That the possibility of such incidents had been increased by the disturbed condition of public opinion was evident, but that this case was a direct result of fanaticism was not credited by any in a position to gauge the real feeling of the country. The Egyptians were very far indeed from sympathizing with the outrage, though it was well known that the Fellaheen have much cause of complaint from the injuries they suffer at the hands of sporting Europeans, who, in all parts of the country, trespass freely on their lands, damaging their crops and property, and only too often needlessly offending the people. Yet here again it was not the facts at issue, but the tone of the pro-English press that was most abundantly productive of evil. The renewal of the unfounded charges of fanaticism, the repeated cry for exemplary punishment, the hurry to try the prisoners, the formation of the special court, various incidents at the hearing of the case, the severity of the sentences, the haste to carry them out, all these things tended to irritate the minds of the people. But of all these, it was the tone of the pro-English press that was productive of the greatest evil. As time passed on, though much soreness of feeling lingered, the agitation was dying out when some Englishmen at home decided to enter upon a campaign against Lord Cromer. These misled by their sympathy with the pretensions of the self-styled National Party, and backed by a few journalists, rejoiced to find a new and prolific subject, almost simultaneously broke forth in an attack upon Lord Cromer. Taking somewhat different standpoints, they all preached the same moral, that the one thing evil in Egypt was Lord Cromer. It was perhaps but natural that the Egyptian papers should follow suit. They did so, and for a time it seemed to me that all the progress they had been making towards healthy, honest journalism was to be swept away. There was something to be said in their excuse. Were they not following the lead of Englishmen? And of Englishmen who professed to sympathize with all their views? Surely these Englishmen knew how to influence their countrymen, 
And how, then, could the Egyptians do better than imitate their methods and manner? And for the Egyptian journalists, we must remember that they work in the face of disadvantages and difficulties that would appall a London pressman. Their articles are, for the most part, sent hot from the pen to the press. They have no cautious, well-trained colleagues to advise or aid them in any difficulty. No accomplished, painstaking readers to point out errors, slips, or inconsistencies in their articles. And the work of writing these articles is liable to a hundred interruptions. All these things must be allowed for, but even granting these as largely excusing the imperfections of the Egyptian journals, there is much left that is a just subject of reproach to the writers. They are far too anxious to swell the chorus of the moment, to harmonize their own ideas with those floating around them, to take the tone and color of their articles from the reading or conversation from which they have just turned. In short, they lack a right sense of the responsibility of their position, and almost all the mental training absolutely indispensable to the journalist who would take a really honorable position in his profession. In the old days of England, when a man had failed in all else, he brought a birch rod and turned schoolmaster. Today, the first idea of the young Egyptian who has not been caught up into the government service is to become a journalist. For journalism is looked upon as the one happy profession exacting no other qualification than the pen of a ready writer. Time will improve all this. The Egyptian press will one day yet be worthy of all that is best in the Egyptian people, and that will prove worthy of the esteem of all men. Meanwhile, under the malign influence of their English friends, the Egyptian journalists have done much to injure their own cause. They are crying out for a representative government, while, by the very articles in which they make their demand, they show the want of self-restraint, of the capacity to appreciate facts, to weigh arguments, to form well-balanced judgments, which are the very first qualifications needed in men who would guide or rule others. And they err in other ways. No one more fully absolves them of all intention to promote or even countenance fanaticism than I do. But as I have said on page 61, when speaking of religious teachers, it is useless for men to preach toleration while they denounce others as enemies, describe them as filled with hatred to the people, and so forth. In the days of Harry Lorrick Hare, when a greatly daring dun or bailiff ventured into the great square at Trinity College in Dublin, he was fortunate indeed if he did not hear the cry of, Oh boys, boys, don't nail his ear to the pump. I do not think that the professed toleration of the Egyptian press is of this type. But I am certain that, accompanied with wild, unreasoning criticisms, it is only too likely to have the same effect. For the young Egyptian of the so-called Nationalist Party, there is also something to be said. His education separates him almost wholly from the bulk of his countrymen. His ideals, his aspirations, are not theirs. He comprehends and understands them as little almost as do the foreigners in the country. With his lack of that home training which forms the Englishman's character far more than aught else, and with his imperfect knowledge of French or English and of European life and thought, he falls an easy, self-sacrificing prey to that ultra-radicalism which is the refuge of the brainless and uneducated in the political world of Europe. In doing so, he belies his own nature, decries his countrymen, and disparages his religion. Rightly named, the party to which he attaches himself should be termed the anti-Egyptian and anti-Islamic party. And yet, this is the class that Lord Cromer's assailants would have Europeans accept as the representatives of the Egyptian people. If there is a party in Europe essentially and wholly in all its forms and all its aspirations anti-Islamic, it is the ultra-radical party. Yet it is this party that the Nationalist Party of Egypt is pleased to accept as its ally. Radicals and radicalism are the ideals that Mustafa Paka Kamel holds out to the Egyptians. He does not use the terms, but the principles he advocates are those proper to the terms. He may call himself a Mohammedan, but the policy he preaches is the policy of a radical, and a man cannot be both a radical and a Mohammedan. If, then, the nationalists desire to promote reform, to protect and develop their own interests, let them fling their radicalism aside and return to Islam. As Spencer has shown, the social and political history of mankind is the history of an evolution. Whether created in the image of God, or slowly developed from some primitive amorphous atom, so far as we can trace our origin, man has been moving, on the whole steadily, though with many halts and setbacks, towards perfection. As yet, our civilization, the highest point yet reached, is but a miserable makeshift for that we should aim at. Let us hope that when the present agitation should have died out, Englishmen and Egyptians will find it possible to join hands in an effort for the mutual attainment of something better. Thirty years ago in India, 
I preached the doctrine that the welfare of the Indian Empire and its peoples was to be sought in the mutual understanding and cooperation of rulers and ruled. Twelve years ago, I began to preach the same doctrine to the Egyptians. Today, I repeat it. Some time ago, urging my views on a Muslim friend, he said, There is only one thing needed to make your policy a success, that all the Egyptians should be angels, and all the English archangels. There is an evident moral in the criticism that needs no pointing. Knowing Englishmen and Egyptians as I do, I believe that the flood of evil that has swept between them will pass away, and that even out of all of this evil some good will come. If Englishmen in Egypt and at home will but try to realize the patient forbearance, the manly self-control that the Egyptian has been and is practicing under the steadily pressing burden of the unhealthy influences of which I have written, I have so much faith in the English sense of justice, fair play, and manly straightforwardness, as to believe that these qualities will compel them in the near future, if not now, to form a new estimate of the Egyptian, and to feel that, with all his faults, he has some sterling merits and is a man to whom all honest, right-thinking men may fitly hold out the hand of friendship. It is my hope that what I have written may tend to this effect and help to bring about a good understanding between the two peoples. The English can, if they will but do justice to their own better feelings, gain and retain the sincere friendship of the Egyptian people, and in gaining that friendship they will gain the friendship of all Islam, and therefore acquire a power and influence in the East such as they can gain in no other way a power and influence that must prove of endless benefit, not only to the British Empire, but to the world at large. But if this result is to be attained, the Egyptian must contribute his share of effort to realize it. That he should do so needs nothing more than that he should follow his own healthy and natural inclinations, and the teaching of his religion. And in doing this he will be serving not only the cause of Egypt, but that of Islam. He will be benefiting not only his own countrymen, but all Mohammedans. In this way, and in this way only, will he find all his best aspirations become not merely possibilities, but actualities, and Egypt will take its rightful place as the great center and fountain of all Mohammedan progress. If, on the other hand, he allows himself to be seduced by the plausible speech of radical agitators, and, following the advice of Mustafa Paka Kamel and his party, abandons the teaching of Islam for the teaching of radicalism, he will assuredly defeat his own aims and sacrifice the claim of his countrymen to be the true leaders in the world of Islam. End of chapter 20. More Unhealthy Influences. Recording by Graham McMillan, San Diego, California. Chapter 21 of Bonaparte in Egypt and the Egyptians of Today. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham McMillan. Bonaparte in Egypt and the Egyptians of Today by Haji A. Brown. Chapter 21. Today and Tomorrow. So far I have spoken of the Egyptians collectively, and I have aimed at sketching as faithfully as possible, not the views or ideas of a class, but those which are common to the whole body of the people of all ranks and grades. Whether there is any one Egyptian or any class of the Egyptians to whom my description might be applied without any qualification or modification is probably doubtful. But that that description, taken in the sense and to the extent intended, is absolutely correct, there is no doubt whatever. The Egyptians of today are divided in opinion upon many points, social, political, and religious. How much so is evident in the fact that of their many newspapers and periodicals, not one is wholly and fully in accord with any other. To have attempted to give the reader a well-defined portrait of each and all of the classes thus formed, had it been possible to do so, could only have resulted in bewildering him, all the more so that, as yet, there is no one class in the country that is not undergoing, more or less consciously, a process of change. It is scarcely possible that it should be otherwise. I have written so far entirely in vain if I have not succeeded in conveying to the mind of my reader a clear conception of the fact that the people are as yet but slowly feeling their way towards the adoption of a definite social and political program. In the maze of conflicting ideas resulting from this condition, there are clear and indisputable evidences of a general tendency towards the final acceptance of certain principles that, once definitely adopted, must dominate the whole future of the people. Of these, the most prominent is that internal and external peace are absolutely essential to the welfare of the country and of the people collectively and individually. 
of any one thousand egyptians taken at random from among any grade or large class of the people i am certain there are not ten who do not sincerely hold this opinion one and all desire a greater or less change in existing conditions but they desire that change to be wrought without any sudden or violent disturbance of those conditions this without any qualification whatever is the fact that is the most essential to be realized at the present moment by any one who would understand the egyptian of to-day it is the one influence that practically controls all the others that are affecting the people the existence of the nationalist party does not in the least disprove this nor does the popularity of the organs of that party disprove it the attacks upon the english occupation so widely spread in the country and almost as widely applauded have no more influence upon the people than a transpontine melodrama of the old type had upon the gods who roared themselves hoarse in rapturous applause of its most virtuous sentiments all the arab-speaking peoples are alike in this that there is nothing else that can so stir their enthusiasm or so fill them with delight as the sonorous melody of well-turned phrases and sentences in their native tongue if the sense of what they hear be clear and evident they enjoy it the more but however dense and impenetrable its meaning may be the music the rhythm and harmony of its sounds draws their applause so even the most illiterate of the people will listen with keen enjoyment to a long political article of which the meaning of all but a sentence or two is wholly beyond their comprehension thus the glowing periods of the nationalist press find ready applause but awaken no echo in the hearts of the people unfortunately it is only too much the same with the papers of a higher type and these labor under the disadvantage that of necessity their articles dealing with prosaic topics do not admit of the ornate style of their rivals none the less it is unquestionable that it is these papers which are exercising the greatest influence upon the thoughts and ambitions of the people and their influence is as i have said almost wholly one for good the great mass of the people listen to the reading of the newspapers just as the great majority of church-going people at home listen to sermons as most edifying and commendable but as having no practical bearing upon the affairs of life yet as i have already pointed out the moyad has been and is exerting a wider and always greater influence and is not only teaching the people to think but teaching them to think clearly and well and now we may look for a moment at the egyptian as an individual to do justice to this subject would need a volume not a paragraph fortunately the reader can turn to lane's modern egyptians in the pages of which he will find a wealth of detailed information needing but little modification to bring it up to date though it fails to give a clear well-defined idea of the egyptian in his daily life let me attempt to supply this deficiency by saying that according to his class the average egyptian corresponds very closely with the average englishman roughly the whole of the people may be divided into five classes first the ulema the natural leaders of all the others secondly the wealthy landowners and others of independent means thirdly the educated mainly professional men and government servants fourthly the great middle class of small land and house owners lower grades of the government services merchants and so forth fifthly the working classes including artisans craftsmen laborers and all who work for their living of each class a book might be written yet i may sum up in broad but accurate outline the character of each by saying that it is in the main that of the same class at home let me take the middle class man getting through his morning and the day's work his one idea is to reach home on his way by train or tram he greets cordially his acquaintances discusses with them the news of the day compares their business or official experiences growls at the shortcomings of the government or the tramways deplores the growing cost of living and laughs over the latest joke or jest once home he has his favorite easy chair and newspapers and has an hour or so of rest with these seasoned with the chat of the harem as to the misdoings of the children or of the servants the coming of visitors household finance and a hundred other topics then out for an hour or so to this favorite cafe where he reads the latest papers muslim and christian and has a game or two of backgammon all the while taking an active part in the brisk fire of conversation going on around him then home again to the ease and comfort of the harem or possibly to entertain some visitors with the unstinted hospitality of his race then supper and then to bed and through all the day at home in his office on his way to and fro if you could but follow his doings and his sayings you would find him in both a very close copy of the man of the same class at home interested in the same subjects discussing the same matters laughing at the same type of jest grumbling at the same grievances 
and withal a man anxious to please and be agreeable, and easily pleased and conciliated, freer than the Englishman in his amities and friendships, ready to chat or joke with his barber or his baker, but, like the Englishman, most at ease and enjoying himself best in his own special circle. And now I must hasten to a conclusion, and reply briefly to one or two questions that my reader may possibly be inclined to ask. What has the occupation done for the Egyptians? It has secured them the personal freedom they so highly prize. It has given them the liberty of getting, keeping, or spending wealth, a free press, a knowledge and keen appreciation of the advantages of a properly organized government, a clearer perception of the natural rights of man and of the personal dignity of the humblest, and, as a result of these, enlarged ambitions and aspirations, greater independence of spirit, and a better conception of the interdependence of each one upon his fellow men. Not much in mere words, but in the reality of the resulting whole an entirely immeasurable amount of good, an amount of good no living man can even approximately estimate, much less appreciate. Possibly some of our children's children will be able to form some adequate conception of its greatness. We of today can no more understand its meaning than did the barons at Runnymede understand the meaning of the great charter they wrung from the unwilling John. Has the occupation failed in any respect? It has in two vitally important matters. It has not in any way qualified the people, or any class of the people, to undertake the government of the country. It has not educated the people, or done anything whatever to ensure the permanency of the good that has been done. As to these failures, I do not think that any other result could have been attained under the circumstances that have prevailed. Lord Cromer, as a sincere well-wisher of the people, and a man of advanced liberal opinion and progressive mind, was the man of all others to work for these things, directly and openly, if it had been possible for him to do so. But it was not possible, or has only become so since the evacuation of Fakoda. Up to that event, the only possible form of government by which the welfare of the country and of its people could be secured was that which Lord Cromer adopted, a benevolent despotism. No other form of government could by any conceivable possibility have attained the results that have been attained, and that form of government could only attain those results when in the hands of a man such as Lord Cromer. Nonetheless, as Mill has said, a benevolent despotism is an altogether false ideal, evil for evil. A good despotism, in a country at all advanced in civilization, is more noxious than a bad one, for it is more relaxing and enervating to the thoughts, feelings, and energies of the people. In Egypt, however, this effect is modified by the attachment of the people to the Turkish Empire, by their objection to non-Muslim rulers, and by all the unhealthy influences of which I have spoken. But while the great mass of the people would much prefer to see the administration of the country entirely in the hands of the Mohammedans, they have absolutely no desire for any other change in the present form of the government. Today, in spite of all that has been done, Egypt in one most vital matter stands absolutely far behind the position it occupied when the English occupation commenced. Then there was a governing class in the country, a misgoverning class, if you will, yet a class that had some conception of and experience in the art of governing, a class the members of which were accustomed to bear the responsibility of ministers. Today, that class, and those men, have ceased to exist. If there had been no foreign intervention at the time of Arabi's revolt, if the Egyptians had been left to work out their own destiny, there would, in all probability, have been a long period of wild disorder and anarchy such as followed the French evacuation. That, in its turn, would have been followed by the rise of a new Muhammad Ali. The occurrence of this sequence of events would have been absolutely certain and inevitable, the only doubtful point being how long the anarchy might have lasted. As it was, there was no man in the country competent to deal with the crisis. Nor was there one in Europe. England was the only country that had a man willing to face the task, and he undertook it under conditions that for a long time rendered it an almost impossible one. The success Lord Cromer has attained is the one and only justification of the occupation as far as its initiation is concerned. In itself, the occupation was essentially a blunder. Having been undertaken, only British pluck and resolution could save it from disaster, and even these, without a man like Lord Cromer to guide them, would very certainly have failed. But the Egypt of 1906 is not the Egypt of 1882. A new revolt, could we imagine its occurrence, would now bring a party, not an individual, into power. 
there is no man in the country who could by any possible combination of favoring circumstances establish himself as a despotic ruler nor is there any other party that could seize the government of the country and hold it anarchy would therefore be inevitable yet it would not be the helpless hopeless anarchy of former days but that of rival parties with more or less definite aims and more or less stable cohesion the only possible salvation of the country after the departure of the french was the rise of a despot like mohammed ali the only possible salvation it could have after a collapse of the existing system would be the triumph of a party or a renewed occupation by england or some other power but omitting all consideration of the latter contingency the rivalry of parties would be a rivalry of systems the men engaged in it would fight as to those of all parties largely and mainly for their own interests but they would fight under the banner of some principle through the profession or adoption of which they would seek the support of the people and they would one and all at least profess a standard consistent in the main with european ideas the struggle would be a long and exhausting one the country and the people would suffer heavily but in the end the egyptian if left to do so would work out his own salvation and a strong government built upon sound and healthy lines would start a new era unfortunately the one condition necessary to the attainment of this result the non-interference of any outside power this one condition would be wanting hence the collapse of the british occupation would be fatal to all the interests of the country and its people nor would the withdrawal of the occupation with all adequate precautions for the preserval of order and a capable administration be much less disastrous if prior to that something has not been done to qualify the people for self-government were the english to leave egypt to-morrow the people throughout the country would hail the evacuation as they did the evacuation of the french and among the most blatant in celebrating it would be those who would be the greatest losers by the change step by step all the old abuses would be renewed individuals and classes alike would be powerless to stay the flood of evil least and last of all the khedive who would be the helpless puppet of the intriguing factions that would fasten around him no matter how pure his intentions how high his aim how great his ability no effort no sacrifice on his part would avail aught for the one condition absolutely indispensable to enable him to follow his own inclinations or to deal with his people as a wise or benevolent ruler would be wanting since that one condition would be the utter exclusion of all european influence from his councils it is not therefore the weakness or faults of the egyptians themselves that would render an evacuation disastrous but the selfishness of europe the very cause that to-day ensures the prosperity of the country nor does it need any supposition of lust or greed on the part of the powers to bring about this evil issue the controlling hand of the british being withdrawn it would at once become the imperative duty of each of the powers to seek to strengthen its own position in the country and let them strive as earnestly as they might to do so in the most honest most generous manner the clashing of interests would be such that none of them could afford to withhold what pressure it could bring to bear in its own favor they like egypt itself would be helpless nothing could enable them to avoid the wrecking of the country save the immeasurable impossibility of a common accord for the harmonizing of their rival claims england must remain therefore not to protect her own interests in the country itself or in the sudan not that she may control the suez canal nor that she may carry the cape railway to the shores of the mediterranean all these she could do without a single soldier or official in the country she must remain to protect the egyptians or rather that they may protect themselves she must remain that the powers may as i believe they most honestly desire to do preserve the common accord essential to the true interests of all that she may the better act as their intermediary in the prevention of discord and ensure that each may benefit in just share from its own contribution to the general welfare but if the cessation of the british occupation would thus inevitably mean disaster unhappily its continuance is not without the possibility of evil as i have shown in spite of the earnest desire of the egyptian people for peaceful progress there is much dissatisfaction in the country it amounts today to nothing more than a want of harmony but a government that has not the confidence and goodwill of the people it rules is like a seaman sailing into unknown ports ever liable to encounter unforeseen and unforeseeable dangers apart from all other possibilities and they are many the continuance of the occupation under a man less able than lord cromer to cope with all the difficulties of the position that might easily lead to endless troubles with a weak rash or obstinate man in lord cromer's position 
and an able diplomat with a knowledge of eastern ways in one of the other consulates no one could foretell what the result might be england will therefore not have fulfilled her duty to the egyptians or to herself until she has taught the people to govern themselves that she may do this the people not a class or section but the whole body of the people must be educated there are some among the egyptians who have seen this and there is strong reason to believe that their views will ultimately prevail meanwhile schools are being established throughout the country at the expense of private individuals and if they are marked by an anti-english bias however regrettable this may be i am afraid it is but a natural result of the existing conditions it must not be forgotten that the government of egypt today is exactly the same in form and principle as that which existed before the occupation the administration has been organized on sound lines but the government is still that of an autocrat ruling through agents responsible to him and to him alone in other words it is absolutely the worst form of government conceivable the most unstable the most liable to disaster and calamity of every kind as mill has said the one of all others most tending to the degradation of the people so far under the benign sway of lord cromer it has proved a beneficent institution but that has been the accident not the property of its form and as an accident it has been wholly dependent upon the extraordinary combination of high abilities and even more the self-sacrificing zeal of lord cromer since the days of the caliphs no man that has ruled the land has ever had such absolute power as lord cromer has had with all the might of england to depend upon he has known how to secure the sanction of all europe for his work happily for egypt and the egyptians he has sedulously sought to use the unlimited power he has thus commanded solely for their good but it must be granted that vast as has been the good he has wrought his task is incomplete and must forever remain so until the government of the country has been placed upon a footing that will ensure the stability now wholly lacking the preceding pages were already in type when egypt and europe alike were startled by the wholly unexpected announcement of lord cromer's resignation for five and twenty years he had guided and shaped the destiny of the country and by steady patient self-sacrificing labor had brought it from a condition of desperate disaster to one of stable prosperity such as but few countries enjoy and none other has ever attained in such a brief period of time from first to last during those long years of indefatigable effort he has striven to exercise the powers entrusted to him with the most absolute impartiality and justice towards all the many conflicting interests with which he has had to deal and all the nations of Europe have borne voluntary and ample testimony to their appreciation of his services in this respect. Yet, as was but just, in doing this he never for a moment forgot that the most even-handed justice demanded that the Egyptians were in all cases entitled to a preference wherever their interests and those of other peoples in any way clashed. So markedly was this the governing principle upon which he acted that Cromer's pets has long been in Egypt a synonym for the Egyptians, the mere knowledge that this has been so has been one of the factors most potent for the welfare of the people and has been sufficient in itself to prevent a host of little evils that would otherwise have tended to mar the perfection of his work without ever deviating in the smallest particular from what rigid justice might have dictated lord cromer might have enhanced his popularity with the european colonists in egypt and with their governments in europe but he has never wavered or hesitated for a moment in giving to egypt and the egyptians the first and strongest claim wherever and whenever there has been a conflict of interests or whatever and whenever a concession to the interests of others might even only possibly have a liability to injure or trespass upon those of the egyptians and what is the return that this people have offered him guided by men whose influence in the country is wholly an influence for evil they have largely refused to join in any expression of thanks to lord cromer for his long and brilliant services it has been my object in writing this book to endeavor to promote friendship and goodwill between Englishmen and Egyptians. I have tried to bring into prominence the good points that I believe the Egyptian to possess. For twelve years I have been an open advocate of an autonomous government for Egypt, and I still believe that it is only under such a government that the interests of the country and its people can be ultimately secured. But, much as it may grieve my Egyptian friends, I do not hesitate to say that their action in this matter, apart from all else or anything else, demonstrates in the most absolute manner the fact that they are not yet fit for self-government the very first qualification for a people who desire to govern themselves is that they should be competent to weigh and value the services of the men in whose hands the administration of the country is placed 
or to be placed. A people who can see nothing in the services of Lord Cromer worthy of their thanks are utterly incapable of forming any accurate or reliable judgment upon the choice of administrators, and therefore unfit for and incapable of self-government. There is no room for doubt or discussion on the subject. I have pointed out in the course of this work that the Egyptians have some reason to be dissatisfied with various features of the occupation. For these, as I have said, I do not think that either Lord Cromer or the government can be justly blamed. They are almost all the inevitable incidents of the effort to place Occidental civilization in an Oriental country. But neither these nor anything that has occurred can in any way derogate from the fact that has been the most salient point in the whole history of Lord Cromer's administration, that he has persistently and consistently, in season and out of season, labored unceasingly with a single eye to the benefit of the Egyptians. If the Egyptians are unable to see that this has been so, they are unable to estimate the services of any administrator, and therefore unfit to govern themselves. Lord Cromer has himself been all through a steady advocate of an autonomous government for Egypt, but he has seen that such a government can, in the interests of the Egyptians themselves, as well as in the interests of Europe, only be granted when, by the self-education of the people, they shall have fitted themselves for the task. I say self-education advisedly, for it is only by self-education that the Egyptians or any other people can ever qualify themselves to guide their own destinies. As I have said on a previous page, I believe that if left to themselves, the Egyptians could and would work out a sound form of government for themselves. But the most essential feature in the question of the future of Egypt is this, that whoever undertakes to govern Egypt, whether the Egyptians themselves or any other people, the government of the country must be one that can and will govern it, not only with sufficient care and regards for the interests of the people, but with equal care and regard for the interests of the European colonists and the other European interests involved. It is the inability of Mr. Dicey and the other critics of Lord Cromer to see this that stamps their writings and arguments with futility. Egypt for the Egyptians, in any literal interpretation of the phrase, is an idle dream. It is no more possible of realization than would be a cry of the ocean for England. It is, I think, Lord Cromer's belief that in time, if he would once set himself the task of learning to govern on sound and healthy lines, the Egyptian would become qualified to take charge of the destinies of his country. If that time does not arrive, it will be the fault of the Egyptian himself. It is not England only, but all Europe is ready and willing to aid him in learning. No other people has ever had anything like the same opportunity of self-advancement. And, keenly as I sympathize with them, warmly as I appreciate their good qualities, I am assured that if they do not attain self-government, the fault will be their own, and their own only. If they elect to be domineered over by an anti-Islamic nationalist party, and to be false to their country, their religion, and themselves, the fault is theirs, and it is they who must bear the consequences. The official statement that the administration is to be carried on by Lord Cromer's successor, in the same spirit and on the same lines as those Lord Cromer has followed, is the best guarantee that the Egyptians or European nations interested in the country could have, that the magnificent work he has accomplished is not to be lost. Years ago in India, an engineer was busy putting the last finishing touches to a great undertaking that had cost him years of thought and labor. The success of his work seemed almost secured, when the rising floods of the rainy season, seizing on a weak and unprotected point, threatened to wreck the whole. I trust I may never again behold such awful agony of mind as that which almost crushed the unhappy man as he gazed upon the roaring rush of the ruthless flood, slowly, surely, destroying the very foundations of his work. Assuredly, it would be a calamity of untold magnitude were the vastly greater work of Lord Cromer to be imperiled for want of any reasonable precaution. End of chapter 21, Today and Tomorrow End of Bonaparte in Egypt and the Egyptians of Today Recording by Graham McMillan, San Diego, California, 2012